Dear Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name and we thank you, Father. We praise you, Lord God. We thank you, Father, for every breath that we take. We thank you, Father, for every moment that we can spend just one more time, one more uh, opportunity, Father, that you might lay before us, Father, to bring one more person to the foot of the cross. We praise you, Father God, for awakening us for the time such as this, for choosing us before the foundation of the world for a time such as this. We pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you will pour out your Holy Spirit upon every single listener of this program. Father, make us at the ready. Keep us at the ready, Father. Keep us on the edge of our seats like you have. We praise your holy name for awakening us. We thank you, Father God, for keeping us excited. Father, we praise your name. We thank you, Father. Holy art thou. Holy art thou. We praise your holy name. Lord Jesus, glorious art thou, Lord Jesus. We praise you. We praise you. We praise you. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Praise your holy name. Father, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that you will just touch every single listener of this show. Every single listener of this show, Father God, where, no matter what part of the world that they are in, no matter what, whether they're listening live or whether they're listening to a podcast, Father, I am asking you in the name of Jesus to outpour the, your Holy Spirit upon every single person, Father, to transform them to the, to the people that you need us all to be, ultimately, Father. We pray in the name of Jesus as we come before you with a contrite spirit. It, that you will mold us and shape us as our potter, that you will create in us a clean heart, O oh Lord. We praise you, Father, for bringing us to the place where we can hang our head in absolute submission to your will, Father God, as empty vessels ready to be used for the end times final harvest ministries that you have brought forth for every single one of us. Thank you for helping us not to think of ourselves more important than another in the kingdom, Father God, and to see the, the, the awesomeness of being united as one spiritual body across this entire world, ready to step out in faith and touch people's lives, raise people from the dead, heal people of sicknesses, and bring them before the before the foot of the cross and, and before our King Jesus. We praise you, Father, for choosing us. We thank you, Father, for making us sharp arrows in your quiver. We thank you for every drink of water, for every bite of food, Father. Direct our paths according to your holy will that we should be ready. If there are any weaknesses, Father, in our walk, if there are any weaknesses in how uh, we think, how we behave, how we feel, if there's anything that that is unclean in our thoughts, anything that is unclean in our behaviors, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will raise these things up before us, Father, that we can make an adjustment to our behaviors. Father, we claim so, uh, 1 Corinthians 11:28 in each of our lives that we should judge ourselves, that we should examine and judge ourselves and make appropriate changes in our lives, for he who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, our King Jesus, is righteous, 1 John 3, 7, and he who sins willfully and habitually is of the devil. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus you will create in all of us a clean heart, O Lord. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will raise up before us anything that we need to know, anything that we need to know as we head into the, into the tempest, into the darkness, into the dark, as darkest times the earth has ever seen. Cleanse us, Father God, cleanse us. Now we pray in Jesus' name. Fill us with your new wine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wow, 20 days, we're 20 days, 20 days away from what might turn out to be a surprise for a lot of us, including myself, but I don't know that the way things necessarily turn out, you know, there's so much rumbling out there, folks. It's just unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like it. I knew that there would come a time when the apocalyptic headlines would be so utterly, utterly overwhelming that there was just I, – I would be filling out the show notes for a radio show like tonight. Shaking my head saying, this is impossible. This is impossible. The 90 minutes that we have before we bring on the guest is simply not enough to talk a little bit about Jesus and the motivational, awesome, exciting, incredible things that are happening to so many of us out there. The Lord is touching many of us. There are little signs. I get pinged, if you will. I get touched by people, messages and things. It's amazing. Sister April sends me a text message and says, I was woke up over and over and over in the middle of the night 
by the Lord telling me, Cascadia subduction zone, Cascadia subduction zone, over and over and over again. I get messages from people who have the gift of prophecy, and, and the information that is flowing in is unbelievable. It's difficult. Praise God. It is very difficult to stitch it together and to say, well, this is going to happen first, this is going to happen second. We know that there's a whole bonanza of apocalyptic, cataclysmic, uh, chaotic events that are about to unfold across the country. There's a lot of people that are very humble, and they're taking kind of a middle-of-the-road position. They're saying, well, you know, God's will be done. Maybe there'll be a delay. But yet, when I look at it from my viewpoint, I can't see that. I just don't see it as even being a remote possibility. Maybe it's because I've been buried under years and years of research and fervent study of prophecies that have all been pointing to the same net end result, all been pointing to this year, essentially. And that, of course, has been fluid over, the, over, over you know, all these years. It's been a fluid, moving target, praise Jesus, because that's kind of how you have to be. Watch ye therefore, watch ye therefore, Jesus says. We have to constantly be watching ye therefore, watching and praying and watching and praying. And we have been. Praise his name, we have been. And it's been very challenging. I just got a uh, text, series of text messages from Brother Ricky Schaff. God bless his heart. He's out there handing out tribulation now cards and touching people's lives. He's concerned in his heart about what, what might happen if things don't pan out the way that, is, that it states on the cards, that maybe he might mi have misled somebody. And I'm like, brother, we've got to get all that stuff out of our heads. It's not how it works. We have to empty ourselves. We have to become empty vessels full of the Lord, prayed up, full of the Holy Spirit, walking out there and touching people's lives, knowing that God is going to work a miracle no matter what. It doesn't matter if every little detail on, on a card or every little detail that we share with somebody when we're planting a seed is precisely how it's going to happen. Anybody who gets, uh, as Brother Peterson and the Peterson Chronicles, anybody who gets a bee in their bonnet over the nitpicky dots and periods periods and, and every little detail being correct in the, in the chaotic world that we live in right now, in the apocalyptic, prophetic, visions, dreams, and prophecies, chaotic, World War III, Russia's about to attack any time, nuclear bombs in cities across the world, a chaotic world that we live in right now. Anybody who's going to be like, well, you had this one uh, you know, in a different order than that one. But folks, it, it doesn't matter. We're on the edge. What matters is that we're doing everything that we can in any way that we know how, to just touch people, to smile. You know, I, I was standing outside. Uh, uh, I had a couple of chores. I had to go out in the front of the house, and this little boy, Javier, I think that's his name. I'm pretty sure it's Javier, uh, came up, and he's just he, cute as can be, and, you know, uh, rides his bike around in the cul-de-sac, and he, you know, he sees my big giant Jesus sign on the back of the car, you know, and sometimes he'll ride his bike over and he'll say, Hey, Hey, um, I saw you out there on the road driving around. I saw the Jesus sign. And, um, and you know, I, 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 I saw him out there and he, he likes my puppy cause you know, he can see my puppy growing up. And I said, Hey, you want to come over and see Bart? And he's like, okay, he was a little timid, and I just – I didn't, you know, of course, offer to take him in the house because, you know, nowadays it's just freak people out. But I opened the door with a screen door and let him look in and, and see the puppy bark. And then we were walking together out to the, um, to the end of the driveway, and I said, a lot of scary, weird things going on out there in the world, aren't there? And he kind of looked up at me with starry eyes, and I said, but you know what? None of it matters because we have Jesus. And he looked up at me with the biggest smile. And you know what? Just those little touches, just those little touches are seeds that will grow into gigantic, beautiful flowers of, of, of trust, reassurance, hope, and faith as things. Can you imagine that little boy standing in front of his freaked out family while they're watching the TV because some horrible tsunami hit the Pacific Northwest or some bomb got set off in Miami or whatever the case may be and everybody's sitting around going, oh no, and little Javier comes in and says, it'll be okay because we got Jesus. See, that's what planting seeds is all about, not getting a bee in our bonnet over whether or not this was said right or that was said right. Who cares? At the end of the day, we just need to touch people with the love of Jesus. We need to touch people and plant that Jesus seed everywhere we go, everywhere we go. 
Right now, there are probably more millions of Americans sitting uh, dazed and confused in front of their TVs, drooling and drinking beer, wondering who's going to win the election that's been rigged for, for goodness gracious, we don't, don't know how long. The forces of darkness, and, and of course, and, uh, uh, folks, I mean, the situation, it's unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. But those of us who have awakened to the depth of the darkness, who understand the, 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 the attributes of, the, of, the, of, of what's – look, even, even guys like Alex Jones for crying out loud, God bless his heart, they don't understand. But yet they nevertheless, they still report on the fact that the skull and bones people and all of them worship – you know, essentially worship the devil. And they do awful, horrible things inside of coffins and do incantations and ceremonies. Uh, uh, asking, uh, you know, uh, otherworldly beings to come inside their bodies and inhabit them. And it's absolutely true. He even refers to them as aliens, which essentially otherworldly, by definition, is an alien, right? Okay, praise God. Maybe they're not the little beady, beady, beep gray aliens or something that you saw in uh, some Hollywood movie, but they're definitely archons uh, from, an, from another dimension. And, uh, oh, boy. I mean, folks, I, I was on the phone. All right, check this out. What a blessing. Praise Jesus. So I'm on the phone. We, we were talking. Uh, Brother Harm, uh, God bless you, Brother Harm Timmerman from the Philippines, uh, sent, sent an email into the program because he does a fabulous job of hooking us up with ideas for guests and stuff. Well, he sent us over and he says, why don't you get bro uh, Brother Bill Deagle, Dr. Deagle, to join the program? Well, we have tried in the past, but I don't know. Uh, maybe we had the wrong email address. We know the guy's insanely busy uh, with his own program and going on other radio shows and all kinds of stuff. Uh, but this guy's highly advanced, and quite honestly, most people, uh, it, you know, what he has to say, it just doesn't sit well with them because it's too advanced. He was involved with black ops operations. Now, you know, he might state it as a little bit differently. He'll use all these, you know, secret agency uh, acronyms and things like that. But, but it's verifiable. People n know of this guy. Uh, he's the one who testified uh, publicly on several radio shows that he saw uh, Hillary Clinton uh, when he shook her hand because he's working in those kinds of programs, you know, top above top secret programs uh, for many, 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 many years. I, I, you know, I've, I've known of him and I have listened to much of his work kind of odd, uh, you know, because listen and thinking to myself, could all this be true? Cause I, you know, it took me years of research and I had, then I had to go into to more years of research uh, into the 66 book canon, more years of research into the ap 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 Apocrypha. And I'm not saying that I didn't sit there and like read the Apocrypha and rifle through it looking for the words the lord over time supernaturally for lack of a better term introduced me to or turned me on to scriptures through other radio shows through other guests that we've had on through people uh that i mean the lord has blessed me and i hope the lord has blessed other people through this program this program has over 822 shows uh, out there for people to listen to. So when people go out and they type things into Google, uh, you know, trying to figure out what are these reptilian things, what are these shape-shifting aliens, what are these, what are these interdimensional beings, what, what does all this stuff mean? They find it frequently. They find old programs that were done years ago by Tribulation Now. Am I some kind of a space alien because I have RH negative blood? You know, that kind of stuff – when you do searches on that kind of stuff, up pops Tribulation Now radio programs. We've been investigating and reporting and looking for hints in the Holy Bible and the Nagamati codices and the, and the, and the epigrapha, pseudo epigrapha and apocrypha now for a long, long time via guests and, and, and different uh, information uh, that we brought forward to, the, to, to God's people. It's only been over the last year that our focus has changed. Praise Jesus, and accordingly so, amen, has been focused on preparing the bride of Jesus Christ and getting us ready uh, for our final harvest. But in the midst of all of that, we have to also continue somehow, in the midst of all that, we have to also continue to um, educate, <laughs> uh, there's a, you know, uh, educate people, if you will, to be prepared because think about it. The majority of people that are touched by programs like the majority, which is heartbreaking, but it's true, are not going to make the rapture. And, 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 and uh, a lot of people don't – a lot of very advanced people don't believe in the rapture. They don't they, because they have been shown by the Lord that we're going to go through really horrible times on the earth. 
The problem is it's both. We're, the bride is going to go through really horrible times on the earth. Amen. But she's going to be infilled with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. The darkness is going to rise up across the earth, and the bride is going to be infilled with the Holy Spirit, the holy and righteous bride, who is practicing righteousness in the fear of God, that he, Jesus, might present her to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and without a blemish, without a blemish, without a blemish, Ephesians 5.27. That means that she practices righteousness in the fear of God. She confesses of her sins every day before the Lord. Why the Lord, who can read our mind, who knows our every thought, who knows the count of every hair on our head, requires us to confess with our lips, confess of our sins, for he is crazy. Think about it. It says in 1 John uh, one nine. If we confess of our sins, he, our Father, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all, all, all unrighteousness. Amen? First John 1, 9. What's up with that whole confessing thing? Okay, that's not, that's between us and the Lord. There's power in our lips. There's power in our tongues. When we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us, when we have Jesus Christ living in us, that power is, is, is amplified through our utterances, through our lips. It's not what goes into the mouth that defileth a man. It's what goes out of the mouth that defileth a man. That is why it is vitally important that we watch everything we, we say. We have to speak holiness. We have to proclaim and make declarations of power upon this darkened and, 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 and forsaken planet praise jesus and and we have to understand that 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 our tongues have phenomenal power even though we don't oftentimes see them at this time at this time soon we will soon we will but it but right now a lot of us are discouraged i admit it a lot of us admit it i've had emails people send emails they're like doggone it doggone it uh because because people do step out there have been people that got on fire they've listened to the uh you know the the uh the the, the divine healing and deliverance show that we do with pastor aaron wagner wagner some some people have uh, got to you know know, gone out and uh, taken the uh, the final Reformation uh, kickstart training uh, that, that they do. I guess the guy's name's Thorben or something like that. Uh, he's from, from Europe, and he travels around all over. Uh, and uh, people go out and take his kickstart training, and then they get excited, and they go out and set a table up or whatever in a park, and they uh, invite people to come over uh, for healing prayer. The problem is it's tough. It's hard. And I've been beseeching the Father and asking him, please, Father, please, in the name of Jesus, let us see more miracles. Let us see more real manifestations of the supernatural in each of our lives now father please prepare us now we i know that we're supposed to walk out in in, in faith i know that that's part of the testing of our resolve i know that god our lord god tests the righteous it's all over the holy bible praise his holy name it's all part of moving us up it's all part of drawing the dross out of us conditioning us making us 24 karat gold creating on us a contrite spirit you know our disappointment and our our struggling with 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 having to wait upon God uh, it makes an, makes a level of a supernatural perfection in us i don't claim to completely understand that dynamic it's all over the bible i do see it and i admit i'm frustrated by it a lot of us are and then something happens in my life and i praise jesus and hope it happens to you too hopefully uh, that is supernatural and it and it makes me go oh oh my gosh uh, like like the event that happened with Sister Diana Pulliam at the last program that we did toward the end, where the Lord had given me not one, but two separate confirmations through the works of Oswald Chambers, who's one of the lieutenants or generals of our Heavenly Father's uh, work uh, in, in the 20th century. Actually, even the, the, the late, late, uh, the very, very early 20th century. Those two con confirming words I received on my chair in the dark, in my prayer chair in the dark, 12, 15, 12 or more hours roughly before the program even started. And there we were discussing the, prof the prophetic glory of God uh, that was given to Sister Diana Pulliam. We were discussing it, and what if? How do we know that, 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 that God, that Jesus has called us to step out? How do we know, uh, uh, you know uh, these things? You know, we're, and that's what it's about. It's not about just making being part of the body of Jesus Christ. It's not about someone taking a microphone. I mean, I can't help it. I'm doing a radio show, but I'm just saying. It's more about fellowship. It's more about learning. 
It's more about edifying one another. The small home church is where it's at. Brother Lauren Peterson, who does the Peterson Chronicles with us, he was unable to receive, or I don't know if he was unable, but he did not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit through churchianity. He went to a small home Bible study. They prayed over him, spoke in tongues, and pow, he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit gangbusters. I have met more people who have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and other gifts uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the Holy Spirit through home uh, gatherings and Bible studies than I have met that have ever received it in the church. There's a lot of people who think they got it in the church, but didn't, because the pastor doesn't even understand it. We're about to see a manifestation in the rising up of the home church across this God-forsaken. It is a God-forsaken country. It's a God-judged country. This country's over. It's end. It's over. The republic has fallen. The republic has fallen. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Just look at what's happening out there. The rest of the countries of the world, of course, the leadership that are probably really not from here. As Brother Robert told us, uh, the SRADID victim that uh, Brother Danny Duvall freed from his torment, as he shared with us, a lot of these global leaders are not even real humans. They're clones or some other – I know. It's like the invasion of the body snatcher, and I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. I, you know, oh, folks, we have done entire programs about this concept. We, uh, you know, I know that there, a lot of them are a little bit dated, uh, but that's okay. Uh, you know, I'm just here to tell you, folks, I pray in the name of Jesus. I don't know how much of this stuff is going to be manifest. The strong delusion, that whole spiel of the strong delusion, the warning there, power, signs, and lying wonders uh, in, in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. How much of that are we going to see before we go? And is it going to be, I guess, intermingled amidst cataclysms and the fall of the republic and the destruction in the third seal and the fourth seal and all kinds of insanity going on across the world. Unbelievable chaos and ma'am, uh, the sorrows period, Revelation chapter 6 unfolding uh, in, in our very midst, on our very doorsteps. Sister Maxine sent me a calendar, and it's got that um, uh, that prophecy out of Joel two. You know uh, that that uh, you know I think it's from Joel two. It says that you will not be afraid of the uh, of the uh, no no no. It's Psalms ninety one. You will not be afraid of the arrow by day, and the pestilence that walks by night. It will not become near your dwelling. In Psalms ninety one. And we're gonna live that stuff, folks. <laughs> As everybody's standing there watching the TV going, Trump, Trump, let Trump save America. Let Trump, you know, I, folks, it's just amazing to me. I, it, I, I'm, I have close relatives that love Jesus with all their heart. But when I ask them why, why are you praying for Trump? Because they're afraid. They don't want to live through a period of time that there are bad things happening here. It, it's 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 very challenging. It takes a major transition and a humongous act of faith to make that transition and to and to make it in such a way that you have truly surrendered. You are no you don't care. You don't care. May the Lord God destroy all of our lives so much so that we all don't care and that all we want to do in Jesus name is serve Jesus. If that's what it's going to take for the Father to get his remnant bride to rise up and be ready to do whatever it takes to bring the last harvest in, if it's going to take a fire burning down our house or whatever, or a meteor falling through the roof of the house or, or some kind of awful terrible, then I hope that's not the case. But the Lord will bring us to that place. That's how he works. Listen to this. I'm going to read it again because this is how the kingdom works. This is from Oswald Chambers, born in 1874, died in 1917. Quote, my unstoppable determination for his holiness. Quote, whether it means life or death, it makes no difference. Whether it means life or death, it makes no difference. And he quotes Philippians 121, where Paul says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. 
He says, quote, Paul was determined that nothing would stop him from doing exactly what God wanted. But before we choose to follow God's will, a crisis must develop in our lives. This happens because we tend to be unresponsive to God's gentler nudges. Now, I'm going to stop for a second and make a comment, because that's my job. I know a lot of people out there who are suffering. They've lost their families. They're rejected. Everybody thinks you're crazy. God's going to reward you for that in a huge way. But you have got to stand your resolve against all odds, no matter what. You have got to surrender your entire life and your entire body to suffer for Jesus. Now, what does that mean, suffer? I'm not saying that they're necessarily going to hang you up on a cross somewhere. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it might require putting you in some dog nabbit uncomfortable situations that you are not initially comfortable with, but with the outpouring of the power of God and the Holy Spirit, you will see miracles, and all you need to see is one miracle of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ flowing through your hands, and you won't want to go home and watch TV anymore. This is why I'm beseeching the Lord and begging him, Father, please let us see, make manifest miracles in our lives now. Let us see these things now, Father, to instill in us a drive and a desire and, 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 and uh, just a, and an abundance of overwhelming emotion to get out there and start this process moving forward. Praise his name. Believe me, folks, we're going to know. But it goes – think about it. But before we choose to follow God's will, a crisis must develop in our lives. Now, I've had my crisis. Am I going to have more? Maybe. And you're like, well, what do you mean you've had your crisis? Well, long, long time ago when I started Tribulation Now – it's a long story, folks. I don't have time to share it all. But I'll just put it to you like this. I freaked out my wife. I freaked her out real, real bad. And it caused a rift in our relationship. But I was so overwhelmed with the requirement of serving God that nothing would stand in my way. And I shut down. And all I wanted to do was serve God, serve God, serve God, serve God, serve God, serve God hallelujah. Serve, and it resulted in a divorce. Well, not really. A, uh, an estrangement of an extended period of time. But we're still friends. The point I'm making is, was that enough? How long will the Lord allow me to stay in the comfort of my home? I live by myself. It's a blessing, but it's also a challenge. It's very lonely. But I'm blessed by so many people. But what happens when the electricity goes off or the, or the internet goes down or all of our communications, which is about to get cut and filtered? Folks, I used to install systems powerful systems that had the ability to go in and look for traffic. Millions and millions of communications channels occurring over the internet all simultaneously and in that gigantic, gigantic uh, freeway of communications be able to go in and pluck out things and kill it and filter it. Uh, we just had, uh, I think it was Ecuador, just recently, Ecuador. Uh, they got filtered. They shut down access to WikiLeaks for the entire country of Ecuador. They've already been practicing doing these things, folks, over WikiLeaks. I've installed those systems. They work really, really well, and the ones that they're using now are ten times better than the ones that I was installing back in the 90s. The point – let's get back to the Oswald Chambers quote. But before we choose to follow God's will, a crisis must develop in our lives. This happens because we tend to be unresponsive to God's gentler nudges. Unresponsive to what? Toss away our other earthly pursuits and serve him. When the Father has identified you before the foundations of the earth to be part of the, of the, of the prophetic uprising of the remnant bride at the end of times, which is we, where we are right now, and you're not responding, the Lord is going to create a crisis in your life. Do you want that crisis, or are you going to, sh sh are you going to change 
how you're you know look for opportunities to get out there now. If you sell out now, but you're like, well, okay, Johnny, what are you talking about? Are you talking about handing out tribulation now cards? No, not necessarily. I'm talking about anything. Talk to people when you're out in the malls. Talk to people when you're at the supermarket. Talk to people when you're at your church. Oh, no, they won't like me anymore. They'll kick you out. Too bad. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Just do it in a loving way. If they kick you out, cause, call it a victory for Jesus. Hallelujah. Because every seed that you plant is going to be another seed that grows and bears fruit. And that fruit will grow and bear more seeds. And that seed will grow and, grow and more fruit. And then it's, it's a ripple effect. Look what 12 disciples did. Well, 12 minus 1 plus 1 <laughs> with Jesus. Look what happened to the world right now. This is amazing. Uh, we, we cannot underestimate the power of just one word. Hey, little Javier. world's kind of crazy right now. But, you know, we got Jesus. You know, he's standing outside with me in the front yard of my house. And there's a big, giant purple and gold Jesus flag waving in the wind. And he knows my car has the giant Jesus sign on the back. I had somebody send me an email. Lynn, Florida. Uh, you know, there was an email from a, uh, from a, from a uh, I don't know, some kind of a news reporting place uh, saying how a lady got pulled over because she had a Jesus sign on the back of her window of her car in Florida and that it was against the law. The actual radio or the actual news article said that it was against the law to, to have such a sign. And, and I went and researched it and found out that that is absolutely not the case. There are websites out there that say it's against the law, but it's actually up to the judgment of the law enforcement officer as to whether or not it materially, materially obstructs the view of the driver. So if so, depending on the, the type of sign and where the sign is located and all that kind of stuff and whether the – anyway, beside the point. The point is that little boy knew about my car and the giant Jesus sign. So don't you see? Why aren't we all out there doing that kind of stuff? Are we all going to wait? For this this prophetic statement of Oswald Chambers, before we choose to follow God's will, a crisis must develop in our lives. This happens because we tend to be unresponsive to God's general nudges. Folks, I had an attempted suicide in my life. Somebody very close to me. I'm not going to get into the details. It's too heartbreaking. When the Lord turned my apple cart upside down, he not only turned the apple cart upside down, he kicked the apples down the street and all the way into next, the, the next county over. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He scared the dickens out of me. And it resulted in the complete upheaval of everything that I knew that was normal. I even lost my job. Now, that wasn't directly related to that event, but it was, you know, it was a series of events that happened in a very short period of time. I got to the point where I was like, blah, 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 blah. what am I going to do? You know, I have had so many, thank you, Jesus, I have had so many crossroads in my life where I had no choice but to say, Father, oh no. And I've said many times on the show how the Lord, in one particular case, when I thought I was doomed, I was sure it was over for me. And I was lamenting and getting up out of my, my bedroom, coming out where I pray. And, and I was just lamenting. And the Lord, which is a sin before the Lord, because we're not supposed to worry and we're supposed to trust God. And, and the Lord said to me, I remember it like it was yesterday. Do you not know who I am? Almost every time the Lord has spoken to me clearly, it wasn't patting me on the back. It was thumping me on the head. One of those little thunky Thunkenheimers where you flick somebody on the side of the head and they go, ow, ow, stop that. It's kind of like that. Give me a little chill down my spine, actually a big chill. But you know what? It was so powerful. Do you know who I am? In my heart, what I heard was, I'm not so happy with me, God. My Father God and your, our Father God created lots of little crises in my life to make me responsive. So I lived what Oswald Chambers prophetically stated in this, uh, 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 in this uh, uh, writing of him. I lived it. Now, is the Lord going to do more? I don't know. I pray that he doesn't. I put a whole brain I put a whole church in the front of my house. I got one of those houses with a front living room and a back living room area, like a family room and a and the front living room I never had anything to do with it. It was like, you know, what am I gonna do? Throw furniture in there and say, Oh, look how pretty. Big deal. You know, I and I stood there and I said, This needs to be a home church. 
I went out and built a big seven foot cross with Lowe's. It cost me practically nothing. This cross, if I if I bought this cross commercially, it would cost me about three thousand dollars. But I but it cost me like a hundred at Lowe's. Praise Jesus. I hung up, I repainted the walls, painted the floors, put folding chairs all over the place. It was very inexpensive. Praise Jesus. It has a podium and everything. I'm ready to have a home church when the Lord makes the call. But it might not be his plan. I'm just thinking maybe it might be for a while, for a time. Or maybe he'll burn my house to the ground, send me out into the streets, miraculously provide for me meals. I don't know how it's all going to unfold. I pray to the Lord all the time, Father, please, I pray that, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you do not have to develop a crisis in my life that forces me into a place that you need me to be. I want to be proactively responsive to what you need for me to do for you. Praise Jesus. All right, and, uh, and uh, that's where we all need to be right now especially. Uh, if you're not experiencing supernatural coincidences in your life, seeing things happening, please, please do get on your knees and seek the Lord with all your heart to, and say, to Father, please, in the name of Jesus, other people, I want to love you. I want to love you with all of my heart. I want to be have a spirit of boldness come down upon me, a courageous spirit of, of the Holy Spirit come down upon me to change me, that, that, that just overflows from within me. Father, change me, Father. If you go before him like that, he will change you, but it isn't going to happen. You're not going to pray for it on Tuesday and get it on Wednesday. It's not how it works. You have to be patient, and you've got to be determined. But, it, but the quote goes on to say, and, and I'll backtrack. He says, he brings us to the place where he asks us to be our uttermost for him through the crisis. And we begin to debate. It's true. It's so true. But, Father, did I really hear what you were saying? I mean, I don't know. I need a confirmation. No, I need a third confirmation. I need a fourth confirmation. I need an angel to show up in my room. I need Jesus to show up and tell me to go out and do something. How many people are going to miss the calling of the bride of Jesus Christ because they're waiting for a confirmation? I don't know. I bet you it's a bunch. Yes, I used the betcha word. Shame on me. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. And he goes on to say, that moment becomes a great crossroad in our life. <laughs> it didn't for me, folks. Let me tell you what. I got shoved down that road, and the, and, and, the, uh, and the holy foot and sneaker of our Heavenly Father went up beside my, you know, buttocks, <laughs> as it were. Hallelujah. But that might happen to a lot of us. And you know what? We're all going to be singing praises at the end. When we get to heaven, we're going to be like, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for that crisis in my life. Thank you for bringing me to the place that you needed to bring me to allow me to receive such glorious, glorious, awesome, eternal rewards for all of eternity. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to be real happy. At the time it happens, we're not going to be so happy. <laughs> but we're going to be real, 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 real happy for eternity that the Lord did the things that he's gonna, he might need to do for some of us. So we need to just buck up and get ready. We've got to prepare. We've got to start getting out there, touching people's lives. Praise Jesus. And there's something else the Lord put upon my heart I've got to share with you real quick. I'm going to read for you an excerpt from the Lester Summerall biography book. And just search on Amazon for Lester Summerall, and you'll see it. Summerall, S-U-M-R-A-L-L, -L, or one L, two Ls. I think you'll still find it. Lester Summerall. This is when he was in the Philippines, and this was a very, very dramatic experience for him. It, it was just unbelievable and full of unbelievable miracles. It was amazing. It was a life-changing event for him, a life-changing event for thousands and thousands of people. He's in uh, the Philippines at the time, and the Lord is working on him to go and deliver a woman who's possessed by a bunch of really powerful demons. And these, in these demons, uh, 
who possessed this lady named Clarita, Clarita, uh, were so powerful uh, that, uh, you know, we're talking about Linda Blair. Uh, she was in a, in a jail cell, uh, you know, in Manila. Uh, it was bad. All the news reports, all over, you know, it was on the news. It was being played over the radio. She was like, rah, 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 and all that kind of stuff on the radio. They were actually broadcasting her possessive fits and stuff over the radio. They had uh, different denominations of, you know, uh, uh, of uh, Protestant pastors and such going in to pray for her. Of course, some of them even got killed uh, by her uh, because, you know, they didn't have the power of the Holy Spirit or the power of Jesus over them at all. Uh, there were some New Agers that went in and tried some hocus pocus, domino stuff. And of course, that didn't work. Uh, but, they, but it was a really serious, very, very bad uh, uh, a mega possession problem with this woman, Clarita, in this jail. And I guess in, I believe it's Manila. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to read you an excerpt from the book about this because it has a lesson that's amazing. It's an amazing lesson, and we all need to consider this in our walk because this possibility is not just for Lester Summerall. This possibility is for every single one of us. Listen to this. Even the editorial – this is a quote from the book. Even the editorial cartoonist that morning had drawn pictures of the entities from Clarita's descriptions. United Press International and other world news services began to report the story worldwide. One news account said – that when a doctor had accused a girl of putting on an act, Clarita had glared at him and said, you will die. Reportedly, Dr. Manuel Ramos had been outspoken in his disbelief in the supernatural na uh, nature of the phenomenon. He made sport of the entire idea before others and stated that the entire thing was some kind of a hoax. According to witnesses, he and Clarita had a confrontation in which she told him that he would die. That same hour the next day, the doctor died without showing any signs of illness. The coroner attributed his death to a heart attack. I read, I read the accounts, and I realized that this had been going on for about three weeks. The newspapers also told of a jailer who suffered the same fate earlier. They said Captain Antonio Ganibi, the chief officer of uh, Bilibib, which is the name of the jail, had become irritated with the girl when she crawled under his desk and there claimed that the demons were tickling her. She would laugh boisterously when he told her to come out and would move her body as if someone's fingers were moving all over her body. And when she finally came out from under the desk, she asked the captain for a small metal crucifix that she normally wore on her dress. Captain Ganibi she reported, asked in a low, whining voice, where is my cruci... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Captain Ganibi, she reported, asking in a low, whining voice, where is my crucifix? I don't know, he reportedly responded. She looked back under the desk where she had been, then said, look in your pockets. You may have it. To satisfy her, the captain turned both of his pockets wrong side out. He placed his pockets as he did. The demon-possessed girl looked at him in a strange way and with her whining voice said, Captain... Look again. He felt a cold shiver go up his spine. As he put his hand back into his pocket, he touched the metal crucifix. He handed it to the girl, and she told him he was going to die, just like Dr. Ramis had. And indeed, Dr. G uh, Captain Ganibi became sick and reportedly wilted like a flower before the sun, and he died. Nothing was ever found organically wrong with him. The large demon, Cl Clarita said, was a monster in size. He was black and very hairy. He had fangs that came down on each side of his mouth. The doctors verified her description by the teeth marks on her body. The smaller entity was almost like a dwarf. He would climb her body to bite her upper torso. Both spirits liked to bite her where there was lots of flesh, like the back of her leg or the back of her neck, the flesh part of her upper arms. They would bite deeply into her, leaving ugly, painful bruises. Reportedly, Dr. Lara and his medical assistants had called in all sorts of observer, observers, medical doctors, surgeons, and psychiatrists, and professors from the Far Eastern University and the University of San, Santo Thomas. Not one had any solution to the problem. Reportedly, many were worried about who would be the next victim of her curse. 
Dr. Lara and his staff, according to the newspaper, had sent out word to their international colleagues everywhere. 3,000 telegrams came in, mostly from Japan and India, telling them what to do with invisible, mighty, with invisible biting monsters. But not one Christian had any solution to the problem. Supposedly, a local group of spiritualists had examined the girl and said it was John the Baptist biting her. Folks, I'm not kidding you. That's what it says. Now, here's the final quote of that section that I'm going to read. Quote, this is Lester Summerall speaking. That morning, God told me, quote, if you don't go, I don't have anybody else. That's the first time I knew that God needed me. It gave me a good feeling. Consider that. That morning, God told Lester Summerall, if you don't go to cast the demons out of Clarita at that jail, because he didn't want to go. If you don't go, I don't have anybody else. While I was in prayer on my knees crying, I was frustrated this morning because I was tired. And I was binding and casting out demons as I always do, walking to different geographic areas of the earth, praying for the power of the Lord to come down and, 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 and angels to be dispatched to save souls of people all across the world. But I'm tired. Spiritual warfare takes a toll on you. Anybody who understands spiritual warfare knows these things, and, and, and I don't have time to go into it. But I was tired. I was feeling very tired. And out of the clear bo- I'm I'm on my knees, folks. And I'm in the name of the Lord Jesus. I rebuke the demons of death in Africa. I bind and cast you out in Jesus' name. I call fire of God upon you in the name of Jesus. And 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 literally within a millisecond of me taking a breath in the midst of this prayer, I hear the words, if you don't go. I don't have anybody else. I actually heard those words spoken in my heart while I was on my knees in travail, crying out for the salvation of the lost in the continent of Africa. See, if I had been sitting in the quiet, it's the uncanny, unbelievable, impossible nature of of, of where I was, how I was praying, where my heart was spiritually supercharged and pouring out the power of Christ through me upon the people of Africa, praying for their salvation, calling down holy fire. I was involved in a full-blown spiritual warfare prayer at the time, and I heard, if you don't go, I don't have anybody else. I heard it, and I started to cry. Because I realized that God was letting me know that I had to let you know that we are going to be put in places where if we don't go, God doesn't have anybody else. We are trained by churchianity to think that, that, that God always has somebody else to replace us with. And, and essentially that is true, but not in every circumstance. Sometimes there are unique circumstances that that person's salvation requires you to step out. And in this case for Lester, thousands of people's salvation resulted. As a matter of fact, the net result of him stepping out and being obedient to God in this particular instance resulted in thousands and thousands of people coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise his holy name. That is powerful. And I had to share it because, well, <laughs> it happened. Praise Jesus. And on that note, I'm going to share with you uh, some amazing things that are going on. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Folks, it's ramping up, and uh, there's no possible way we can cover all the things we need to cover on the show and the things that the Lord wants me to get out there and the prophecies, but I'm going to try as hard as I can. Praise Jesus. Uh, Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Father. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. And here we go. Let me go ahead and share this with you. All right. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Now, there are some supernatural things that happened that have been happening. Signs. 
the signs are so amazing, but if you're not if you're not really tuned in and you haven't really learned to hear the voice of God and how he talks to us in the many faceted ways that he does, then you might be missing a whole lot of stuff that he's saying to you, which I hope that you take the time to listen to hearing the voice of God, or hearing God's voice, or how to hear God's voice uh, at tribulation-now.org. Okay, it's in the black banner section. Just search in the links there. So it's a powerful program to, to get a, a kickstart forward. Pun intended. Praise God. All right, now, when you, when, when you are awakened and you're walking in the Spirit and you see all the different ways that the Lord speaks. Uh, earlier I mentioned Dr. Deagle. Let me share with you real quick what happened. We're booked out, thank you, Jesus, into the, it, well into the month of November. And um, the Lord is blessing us with guests. And thank you, Jesus. Some of them are coming back because their testimonies are so powerful. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, that being said, Brother Harm recommended that we get in touch with Dr. Bill Deagle, which, of course, I've known about him for years and listened to many of his, much of his work. And um, we tried to get him on the show before, but who knows? Didn't work out. Uh, didn't get a response. Harm suggested it again. I went and looked into it today, and it was amazing. It was amazing. This person that we had a very difficult, impossible time getting in touch with earlier, many, many months ago, I'm literally talking to him on the phone within less than 20 minutes of making a single phone call. I'm talking with him on the phone, Dr. Bill Deagle. Deagle. It was amazing. And a lot of people are like, well, they, they don't feel good about stuff that Dr. Bill says because he's, you know, some kind of a intellectual savant and he knows stuff and he worked in the black ops and the Lord has anointed him in a powerful way. Now, I used to have a little bit of reserve about him, but I went to his website and probed around and he has a link on his website that says, I think it's like a hundred things that Jesus did or a hundred things, you know, that, that Jesus said. And I went and looked at that and I was deeply moved, deeply moved. And I knew at that moment in time that he was absolutely the real deal. He loves Jesus, but he is so advanced that most of the things he says, people will, it won't, it won't set well with them because they are not comfortable with that, some of that subject matter. The problem is that we've run out of time, folks. We have, we've run out of time. And I knew it. And I looked at the calendar, and I was thinking, oh, my gosh, we're booked into November, and the Lord's going to bring us more guests, and we're going to have to book them into November. And, you know, we need to get what Bill Deagle has to say. And I'm not saying everything that he says is 100 – how could I possibly know if everything that he believes that the Lord shared with him is 100 percent accurate? How could I know? You know, we're all going to just have to wait and see. It's as with anybody who has the gift of prophecy. We all see through the mirror dimly. But Bill does speak very authoritatively, and it does freak people out a little bit. Now, I will, we'll share with you about that. But his understanding of the black ops, the underground bases, the shapeshifters, uh, the, the fallen creatures, uh, you know, what Hillary Clinton actually is, uh, you know, he has a gift of uh, uh, discernment that is unrivaled. I, I have, I, it's, it's unbelievable. But it's believable for guys like me who were born and raised in Pentecostal, you know, non-denominational, supernatural walks. I mean, I've been around people that are similar. So to me, it's, I don't have second thoughts about it. But I really got the confirmation when I went to his website and I was like reading all these, you know, 100 things that Jesus said, link right on his website. I was like, man, unless you're full of Jesus, you'll never put something there. Nobody that has demons is ever going to put anything like that on their website. Because the demons will probably kill them. So anyway, I, I, I was on the phone with him. Within t like 20 minutes, it was unbelievable. I was like, and we were talking and stuff. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm lamenting. I'm like, oh no, you know, I got to get, how are we going to get him on the phone? How are we going to get him on the show quick enough before all hell breaks loose? And he's, he's saying, well, just send me a list of dates. Uh, I got to go, you know, because he's just insanely busy like we are. And, um, and uh, he goes, I got to go. Just send me a list of dates, and we'll, we'll figure it out. And he was, like, getting ready to hang up. I said, Bill, you're not going to believe this. I was looking at my email inbox at the time that we were talking, at the moment that he was saying he had to go and that I should send him a list of dates. I'm looking at my inbox, and in my inbox pops in at the top of the e e email list the person, who, the, 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 person the lady in the ministry uh, uh, that we were going to have come and speak on uh, the 23rd, this Sunday night. Uh, 
and it said, we have to cancel in the subject line. While I'm on the phone with Bill Deagle, it doesn't get any better than that. I had the Holy Spirit over me to a point where I could not believe. Uh, I was like, huh. What? I mean, it was amazing. I love that feeling. And I was like, oh. And I said, Bill, you're not going to believe this. I said, I've got the Holy Spirit all over me. We just had a cancellation for this Sunday. Is there any chance you're open this Sunday night? And he said, book it. Let's get it done. Praise God. And I said, all right. Hallelujah. So I'm just flying by uh, Hebrews 11, uh, uh, chapter 1. Uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So that just happened. I mean, there's all kinds of little mir- miraculous, impossible things happening in my life, and I hope they're happening in yours, too. Praise Jesus. Now listen to this. Listen to this. So the Washington Post... Actually, here, let's let's play a little dramatic intro because this stuff's kind of spooky dramatic. Dun, 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 dun. Washington Post. At the last state dinner, the last state dinner of the Obama White House, the word of the night was bittersweet. Or was it? All right, listen. This was published on the Washington Post. This is on their website right now. And they have their logo splashed all over it. By the way, uh, the Antichrist, I'm sorry, Obama, is standing in front of a podium as he's making this statement uh, with, it, with, a, uh, with a pretend eagle, which is really a phoenix bird. Very dark stuff. Listen to what he says. Welcome to the final state dinner of my presidency. But in the immortal words of a great Italian-American, Yogi Berra, it ain't over till it's over. Okay, that is the devil at work. That's the macabre. That's the darkness. That's how it speaks. It speaks in code. It's called lesser magic. That was him basically telling his fellow devil worshippers. <laughs> it's, it's an announcement. Get it? Okay, well, guess what? There was another one by the other entity. The other entity that is going to drive the country to the utter and absolute, utter, absolute destruction. The rise of the Fourth Reich will occur. There's no question about it. And the two of them... You know, the, the, if you will, the type of Hitler, which would probably be Hillary, and then the type of Obama, which, goodness gracious, could only be – who knows? But <laughs> just remember, the, 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 the name Fuhrer uh, was given to Hitler. They did not have the name Fuhrer in Germany. They made it up just for Hitler. They'll probably make up a special name uh, for the Antichrist. Who knows? But the other entity – puts out a full-page ad in the, uh, let me look, New York Times. Full-page ad in the New York Times. I I believe it's probably still out there. And it has her, it, uh, looking off the opposite direction, like it's it's official. Uh, And and, and it, it says, in big white letters on a black background, I'm the last thing standing between you and the apocalypse. Now, to the un to eyes that are not open to the way that the forces of darkness work that looks like a cliche saying that if you don't vote for me you're going to get Trump and Trump's going to take you into the apocalypse mm. that is not what it means mm. that is not what it means what that is is that is a demonic statement from a entity a fallen angelic being that has taken over some kind of a whatever cloned body form thing. Just go back and look at the spasms. Those are, it's not some brain tumor or Parkinson's like people are saying. Those are demonic spasms. Ease in, Let's translate what this entity was actually saying on that New York Times ad. Quote, 
she was it was saying i am standing here between you and the inevitable apocalypse what it says in the ad it says i'm the last thing standing between you and the apocalypse what it was really saying is i am standing here between you and the inevitable apocalypse amen that's what it was saying. I believe it with all of my heart. And then listen to this. Uh, uh, um, uh, all over the news, Donald Trump is saying that elections are rigged. Elections are rigged. Well, they've been rigged forever, and he knows it. And he's try- who knows if he's in on it? We don't know. But, but Obama comes forward in his official Antichrist podium, and he says Trump rigs the, uh, Trump's rigged election claim is whining before the game's even over. Nana boo-boo, nana boo-boo, point your finger. And then all over the news, the, the news is like going, oh, we're indignant. The, the elections are rigged. No, they're not. And so all the people on the news, who we already know they're rigged. We already know they're a bunch of lying, talking heads reading from a script. We're, we're in. We get it. We see you lying. We see you lying. Praise Jesus, hallelujah. And guess what? You're standing there in your little committees and your little groups on, and, and you're talking heads, uh, it's talking back and forth to each other with your microphones telling everybody, well, we're just going to fact check. We're going to fact check whether or not the elections are rigged. What? Wait, that's like the talk about the devil calling the devil the devil. <laughs> the pot calling the kettle black. And then listen to this headline, Kremlin insider, war might begin even before the United States election, urges citizens to stockpile cans of food. A Kremlin insider has warned that war with the United States could break out even before the November election in the United States, urging citizens to stockpile for food. Sergei Markov, uh, a member of the Civic Chamber, a Moscow-based state institution, told the Daily Beast, uh, these are the most serious tensions between Moscow and Washington in decades. Amen. Now I have a question for the thinking individual. What does that mean? Can somebody please tell me what a war with Russia and America means, please? Hmm? When two superpowers that have the ability to vaporize each other in 20, sec- or 20 minutes, because that's the time it takes for submarine-launched nuclear missiles to hit their targets from the subs to the point of impact, 20 minutes. Maybe a little longer. No, it's probably about the same for us in Russia, too, because we got subs in the med. You can believe that. And the Black Sea. 20 minutes. So what does a war between Russia and America mean? Does it mean we're going to go out in, 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 in a field somewhere and shoot at each other? Come on. We're already at war with Russia. It's called a proxy war. That's how superpowers battle on the battlefield. They put other uh, uh, groups of people out there who have a, quote, cause, and they give them an official name, and then they give them tons and millions of dollars and, and white, Nike, uh, white Nike sneakers and white pickup trucks with lots of weapons, and they give them a name like Isis, which is named after an ancient Egyptian goddess, okay? And then they go, oh, no, it's scary, scary Isis. That's how they do it. It's called proxy wars. All the wars that are taking place right now were created by the United States of Babylon the Great and possibly some of it by Russia and Saudi Arabia, for sure. And who knows what Turkey's up to. It's dark out there. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Anyway, so folks, I don't know what it means. But when I use a little bit of, you know, a little bit of what teeny weeny little bit of common, common sense I might have, I can't think of what it could possibly mean. So what I do is I fall back to the Sarah Manet vision. I fall back to the Dimitri Dudeman visitation by the angels. I fall back to the A.A. A. Allen vision of 1954. I fall back uh, to all of the, the, the prophetic visions given to uh, uh, Maurice Sklar with the two nuclear missiles exploding an electromagnetic magnetic pulse over America and Israel at the same time. I believe right around the time that the uh, peace treaty is signed over Jerusalem. But I, I don't know. Upon those prophecies, uh, if you research enough of them, what you see is a timeline that seems to indicate that not only do we have earthquakes, tsunamis, 
possibly meteors falling from the sky. I'm not talking about the big Mac Daddy six seal meteor. I'm talking about like a meteor shower that causes fires all over the world and stuff uh, that's really apocalyptic, but not big enough to cause, you know, the six seal. The global earthquake of the six seal. I see a crescendo, a ratcheting up of events that happen super fast. Uh, what, what Billy Brim called the suddenlies in her vision, according to John Shorey and her prophecy. Those suddenlies, what are they? And how many of them are there? And, how, and, and does it continue? Does it keep on going boom, 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 one right after the other? Well, that's what the Bible seems to indicate. That's what the prophecies seem to indicate. It seems to indicate that once this stuff, once that big red lever gets pulled... It's just going to be, oh, 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 man, including nuclear bombs, ground-based. So the prophecies don't seem to indicate that there will be ground-based nuclear explosions in the United States. When? Well, I don't know. But let's go ahead and fast forward to the prophecy section of the show and take a look at what Sister Bet Stevens was uh, 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 shown by, through the Lord. All right, praise God. This, uh, hopefully I didn't make a mistake. It was kind of last minute-ish, but it came out on October 19th, uh, and it's published on Z3 News, and it's entitled, A Nuclear War Came Without Any Warning and Took Down One City. I find that very, very interesting because it's odd. A nuclear war taking out only one city? Hmm. This also aligns with Rachel Baxter's multiple visions. Uh, uh, you know, she's seen multiple times Chicago burning. Could it be Chicago? Is it? What about David Wilkerson seeing the fire rolling down the streets of Manhattan? Could it be more than one city? Let's read this. October 13, 2016. Sister Bet, I was given two separate visions during the third watch of the night. The first one is shared here. Let me preface by saying that when a prophet or prophetess brings a word from the Lord, such as a warning, it is to be done in humility because without any warning or judgment also must come a remedy or with any warning or, ju or judgment also must come a remedy or a solution. A prophet's, uh, all prophets must adhere uh, when giving a word or of warning that is uh, from the Lord that is uh, that it is within scriptural boundaries with all that being said hear the word of the Lord I usually wake up and pray and read but I felt I, I fell into a light sleep and saw myself watching a nuclear war taking place it came fast without any warning and it took down one city it was not anywhere else in America <laughs> wow, does this resonate with my spirit because it matches the other prophecies uh, that, that, uh, that are along this line, They're, namely Rachel Baxter and, and David Wilkerson, etc. It goes on to say, I was not given the name of the city, but the aftermath. Oh, the aftermath was very detailed. It was so terrible. The people were laying on the ground. The city was completely in ruin. I will not go into the graphic detail. The devastation was too horrible for words. As I was coming out of this vision between a Asleep and awake, I was grabbing for a gun. I actually woke up and grabbed for a gun as if there was one in my pocket. I was very determined to find a gun. I don't know why, because I don't own a gun. <laughs> yeah, amen, praise Jesus. Praying for the revelation on that one. And when the voice of the Lord came, this is, uh, this is just the beginning. Many will try to excuse it away, but my word, word will sustain those who call out to me. My word is truth, and it is life. I could only ask, Lord, is this a judgment? And the Lord answered, yes. And then I asked, Lord, I know these things must come but is this final and the lord asked uh, the lord answered yes because not just america but the world has left me no choice they have sold their birthright i suddenly had a fear of the lord in my spirit and that was and that was the end the second vision was a timely word from the lord a message of hope for true believers so stay tuned please take all the words to the lord in prayer amen praise jesus all right uh, and let's go on to the next one 
final acts of betrayal by your leaders commence. This is a prophecy uh, uh, from I am calling you now, Sister Julie Wedby. All right, praise Jesus. Uh, and again, I'll read the title. The final acts of betrayal by your leaders commence. Where will you be in that hour when everything changes? I, the Lord, will afflict this nation, the United States, because of the multitude of her transgressions. You have grievously rebelled and turned aside from my commandments. I will do that which I have devised. My word will be fulfilled, as I will cause all to fall, and I will not pity. I will cause the enemy to rejoice over you as he dominates for a time. Where will you stand in that hour in which everything changes? For I tell you, in in an hour, on a day you know not, your existence here will be forever altered. In a moment of time, nothing will ever be the same again. With your faith, stand the test. You will rest in my promises and stand on me, solid ground, or or will you succumb to the madness that will ensue? You have been given ample time to prepare yourselves. The days of mercy now give way to the hour of justice. The final acts of betrayal by your leaders commence. It is not possible for you to comprehend the depths of the evil at work now. Satan works in fury as the hourglass empties itself. Revelation, the book of Revelation in the Word, is is your reality. Words in parentheses are mine for clarification with the Father's permission. Gird your loins. Brace for impact. Stand firm. Be strong and courageous. Fear not. You who have chosen the narrow way of righteousness and holiness, for I am your pavilion. pavilion. You shall not fear the terrors by night, nor the arrows that fly by day. The hour of testing is here. Yeshua. Wow. This one has uh, uh, met with uh, incredible, uh, I don't know if the term is notoriety uh, or or blessing. I guess it depends on the audience, Uh, but uh, this one got uh, the, uh, the, captured the attention of Brother John Shorey, who just recently, or is just very recently, going on uh, to the um, uh, 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 Jim Baker show again, Uh, and uh, it's, it's gone viral. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Now, that being said, Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. This is from uh, Brother Jeff Byerly, and it is entitled, I Will Not Repent of the Destruction That Is Coming Upon America, 10, 13, 16 through 10, 15, 16. Quote, this message grieves my heart to write, and even now I have tears streaming down my face. I must be obedient to my call and release the message in hope uh, and prayer that a few will receive it and turn to the only one that can save them. Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 9, For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. These words were spoken to me in the Spirit. Quote, Those who have spiritual eyes to see and spiritual ears to hear, look and listen. I tell you that these things, I tell you that these things, I tell you these things so that fear will not overcome you and so that you are, you are prepared. I am the only shelter in the, of the, for, from the coming storm. Under the shadow of my wings, you will find peace and comfort. I am the song in your heart. I am the only joy for your soul. I am love, and you will arise and shine as my glory is poured out upon you to give you strength. When you see the event, that has been prophesied by my messengers and foretold by my fallen ones, you will understand what time it is. It is the time of the end. It shall not be postponed, for once again I tell you, very few have turned away from their sin. On the contrary, this world gets darker by the day in every nation on the earth. Then he will begin this, uh, this season strong in me, but will stumble and fall because of fear and doubt. You must remember my words and my promises, and keep yourself humble before me. You must show your love to your fellow man, your neighbors. If you turn them away, you are turning me away. You must walk in the power of my Holy Spirit, through a stumble and even fall, you will not uh, you will not stay down. You must be born of the Spirit and your sins washed away by my blood, baptized and be full of my Holy Spirit to make it through this time. Pray in the Spirit without ceasing uh, will be the way that you gain the strength and refresh yourself to be able to stand back uh, stand back up after you fall. Those who have been causing division in my body will be stopped, for they shall be shaken by the very core of their being by this event. My body shall be shaken the hardest, for it is asleep, and I have said, I have said, enough, awaken, 
I will once again flip the tables of, of the money, money changers. All religious activity that uses my name yet is without the power of my Holy Spirit will cease to exist. There will be no more middle road of compromise. You will either follow me or follow the enemy. It, I tell you ahead of uh, time that my way will not be the easy way, so count the cost now, but my way is the only way to life. My way will be, the sup- will be supernatural in protection, power, and provision. And what of the one who was to make you great again? I am the great I am. Disease, famine, civil war shall be upon your land, and brother shall fight against brother, and father against son. America, I tell you, troops from other nations that are said to bring peace will divide your land and hold you captive. My city and my land will never be divided. Uh, will, will will never. Uh, my city and my land will never be divided by you. I will not allow it. Uh, this land shall be divided by a great earthquake, and the sea shall rise upon you, O Babylon the Great. War looms by the horizon, even now. War looms on the horizon even now as you concentrate on things that don't matter and will never come to pass. In the end, America shall fall in one day, and it shall be burnt from one end, from, uh, one end to the other in the end. Then your false hope shall arrive from the heavens, and most will take their mark and worship the beast because they did not know me. Oh, why America could not see that I am your Savior. I have warned and pleaded for you, America. For many years the warnings are over. Oh, how I have cried and interceded for this nation to come back to me, but it will not. You have been blessed with more abundance of food and material wealth than any nation, but yet you do not thank me. You stand tall and proud because you uh, will be made, but you will be made to bow as you are humbled. I have loved you, but you have gone after idols and strayed from the straight and narrow ways. This is my final course of action toward you, America. It has never been this way. I have a remnant in you that I will protect for they will be the reapers of the greatest harvest of uh, the great harvest of many souls many uh, many more of my own shall I take to be with me out of the devastation and destruction brought upon this land America this is your final hour repent before your creator savior and God I will not repent of the destruction this is coming upon America I am Jesus the risen lamb slain from the foundations of the world Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. And on that note, let's break into the, oh, we're running out of time again. Uh, it, well, well, we'll skim over really fast the headlines because, folks, it, we already covered a bunch of the most important headlines. And there's more chaotic headlines that I can th- toss over the wall to you real quick. Before we bring on, uh, praise Jesus, uh, uh, Dave and Dono uh, Car- Car- Carico. Uh, now, um, uh, I am going to be doing a little bit of fishing for them because I have uh, 812 as their area code number uh, uh, of, of their calling in number. But I'm, I, uh, he, uh, Brother Dave had said him and his wife were going to call in. I'm not exactly sure how they're going to work that out. That's okay. We're just going to kind of wing it. And uh, in the meantime, let me go ahead and hit the news. It's not normal. All right. Praise God. And this is the as in the days of Noah section of the news. Praise God. Young Italian priest finds exorcism too scary. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) If I was a Catholic priest and I knew what I know, you ought to find it scary. Oh, my goodness. Despite the rising demand for exorcists in Italy, younger priests are not applying for the job, which they claim is too scary for their level of experience or their level of Holy Spirit, which is like zero. (sighs) God help us all. Uh, Listen to this. KTLA-5 UFO expert found dead after vomiting black liquid, texted mother warning days before his death. Uh, This is a – this is one of those uh, super soldiers. There's a lot of these super soldiers out there that are uh, breaking out of their mind control uh, uh, prison and coming forward. And this is one of the guys. He's very similar to the guy known as James Casbolt, uh, also known as Michael Prince, who was killed in the same manner. Uh, but uh, his name is Max Spears. He's at the age of uh, 39, and it's a big deal. Matter of fact, this is so well known that the mainstream media are, are so so common 
nowadays. Uh, nobody, no mainstream media reports said anything about James Casbolt, Michael Prince, when he was killed. One of the most well-known uh, super soldier, mind control slaves uh, of of. Uh, history uh, and nobody said a word when he was killed and now this is being discussed on ktla uh channel five in, in los angeles <laughs> and a lot of other stations too as well so it's amazing how uh front and center and mainstream this creepy weird mind controlled darkness super soldier underground base stuff has become people are waking up glory be to jesus hallelujah and now we go into the signs in the sun and the moon and the star seas roaring section of the news Earth-facing, growing whisk of powerful solar storms that could reset civilization. Amen. And this is from Space.com. Solar storms that threaten Earth about every 100 years, uh, as, and, and it says, and experts warn that we are overdue. Uh, and little do they probably even realize uh, that uh, the first trumpet, I believe, is a solar uh, – the Mac Daddy of all Mac Daddy. As a matter of fact, if you want to see how big the first trumpet solar uh, storm, not solar flare, not CME, solar storm, big difference, okay, uh, it is, then watch the movie Knowing with Nicolas Cage. And if you, can't, if you don't like the movie, just fast forward it to the last 20 minutes, and you'll see uh, the, uh, the forces of darkness put a scene in that movie uh, of the first trumpet because, you know, who knows better than even theology does? Them, them, the forces of darkness know more than even our own churches do today. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, that, 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 that the remnant bride is waking up. Uh, uh, praise the Lord. Now, um, I'm just going to repeat again the, uh, the articles that are coming out, gangbusters, about thousands of asteroids that are perilously close to Earth and the fact that an executive order was just signed by uh, the Antichrist, uh, I'm sorry, Obama, uh, that's, that's actually called Coordinating Efforts to Prepare the Nation for Space Weather Events. So what's happening? What's coming? And they mentioned solar flares and all that kind of stuff. So who knows, folks? All right, so we got to buckle up. Listen to this. 2016 ends up uh, with three supermoons. So October 16th, November 14th, and December 14th. December 14th. All of these are three supermoons. What does it mean? Signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. Seas roaring. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We don't know. Praise God. It is unbelievable, the stuff that is happening. Now, real quick, because we're at the uh, 30 minutes after the hour, let me take a quick scan down through here and see if uh, Brother or Sister Car Carico has joined us. And I'm looking for the uh, area code coming in from there. Because uh, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Nope, I don't see him on this call, Doc. Hopefully they'll press one, and it'll work, and it'll send them to the top of the call, Doc, and I can bring them live. All right, praise Jesus. Let's go ahead and scroll down, just in case they do call in any second now. Let's go down and hit the, um, yeah, praise Jesus. It, we'll go ahead straight into the section of the wars and rumors of wars new world order violence sanity upheaval and wars and rumors of wars praise god from the sun the russians are coming the russians are coming i kid you not folks actually says in the headline the russians are coming vladimir putin's nuclear warships pictured steaming towards the english channel as the royal navy prepares to scramble f a fleet the Russian fleet is believe, uh, believed to be planning military drills off the Scottish coast uh, before heading towards the Med. Donna says, please give them the phone number to call. Huh. Okay. All right. Praise God. They must have lost the email. Um, so I'm going to try to – now, why would – okay, I'm a little bit confused, but that's okay. I'm just going to act out of faith. Faith is the substance of things seen and, and um, hoped for and, it's, and, sub, and the evidence of things unseen. Praise the Lord. All right, so let me see if I can find their – all right, there we go. All right, I'm going to send an email to fojradio uh, at aim.com. And uh, let's see, they do have another um, email here. I'll just go ahead and send it to their ritual abuse free uh, as well. And uh, I'll enter the number right into the subject line. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Father. 319-527-6020. Press 1 for, for the host. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. I'm hitting send out of faith. Um, uh, uh, 
I'm also going to send a text message to Sister Mary Lee. Mary Lee, please tell them the number your way to. All right, and I'll refresh Mary Lee's memory just in case she doesn't have it memorized. Glory to Jesus, 312 527-6020. Five two seven six zero oh, two zero. Oh. There we go. Praise God. All right. So let's go ahead and continue. I'm going to keep my eye on the console. Hopefully they'll press one to talk to the host. And again, it'll it'll bump right up to the top of the calling dock. Praise Jesus. All right. Now listen to this. This is right off of the hot press of the Infowars team uh, and 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 Alex Jones. Listen to this report because it's you know he's right. He's right. All right. Praise God. Let's listen to this. <laughs> It's Sunday, October 16th, 2016. I am filing this emergency voice memo to YouTube and Facebook because, quite frankly, every minute is critical. Time is of the essence of what I'm about to reveal to you. Now, much of what I'm about to say is public knowledge, and you're going to be saying, Alex, tell us something we don't already know. And in that lies the key to what I'm trying to get people to think about here. Joe Biden on Wednesday came out, the vice president, and said, we're going to launch a giant cyber attack against the Russians because we say the Russians have been involved attacking the Democratic Party and this election. No proof, no nothing. And it was the political CIA controlled by Obama that came out and backed up Biden, not the NSA that would be over the actual cyber attacks. And revealing who supposedly is behind it or who isn't. So they come out and they, they, they pre-program the public that the Russians are our enemies and that we're going to have a war with Russia, and they're trying to get no-fly zones in Syria, and they're asking Congress for the authority to hit Russian military hardware that is inside Syria. The bottom line is this. A state of war between the United States and Russia now exists Because doctrinally, NATO three months ago and the Pentagon three months ago, as well as Hillary three months ago, all came out and put it on paper, but also said it, that if Russia cyber attacks us, our doctrine is to hit them with another cyber attack or to physically attack them militarily, not in a cyber way. Now they come out two weeks ago and say, oh, we have proof the Russians hit us, but never produced the proof. Then a week and a half later, Biden comes out, as I mentioned, and says, we're going to hit the Russians really big in the next few weeks. This is clearly to disrupt our elections. But did you hear what I just said? We are in a state of war with the Russians right now. Amen. So if uh, the Bet Stevens prophecy or, you know, vision slash prophecy comes true, if the Rachel Baxter uh, prophecy vision come true, prophetic prophecies uh, come true. Uh, if other evidence that I've collected over the years comes true, oh boy, folks, could the, for lack of a better term, quote, as the father put it through br- Brother Jeff Barley, could the event, could the event, if you will, the kickoff to the apocalypse, the beginning of the worst period that the earth has ever seen, could that event be a nuclear destruction of an American city? That's the question. We need to be, folks, we need to be seeking the Lord. We need to be seeking the Lord fervently right now. Fervently. I pray that you take to heart uh, the things that we were able to share with you uh, according to the Lord's anointing and blessing and, you know, just abundant grace upon this program, last program and in the beginning of this program, because uh, there are. And amidst all of the prophecies of the remnant bride rising up is. Unfortunately, also prophetic words of the Lord warning that many will not stand up and take the assignment. Pray in the name of Jesus that not one listener of this radio show fails to stand up and take the assignment when the Lord offers it. We all need to be ready to get up, go out, touch people's lives, lay hands on the sick, cleanse the lepers, uh, cast the demons out, and, 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 and raise people from the dead. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, like the remnant bride of Jesus Christ was chosen to do before the foundations of the earth. And, and you can't do that. 
you know, hiding in your basement with beanie weenies and, and chewing your fingernails. Praise God. So we got to seek, seek the Lord with all of our heart right now. All right. One, a couple more headlines, and we're, I'm going to bring uh, Sister Car- Carico, and uh, hopefully um, uh, Brother Dave w- will be with her. Phil- listen to this. Reuters, Philippine police van drives at protesters to break up a anti-U.S. demonstration. Folks, the Philippines is... Just a, it's a type of what's going to be happening in America very, very soon, folks. And they're running trucks over people to stop the, the protest. It's unbelievable. I saw it earlier today. Listen to this. The, in the United, K, the United Kingdom actually shut down bank accounts of Russia today's uh, media outlets in the U.K. To, to shut them up, shut down their bank accounts. The way that they got the word out was through Twitter. Uh, it's just unbelievable the stuff that's happening. Uh, praise God. Uh, 15 people reportedly taken hostage in Belgium supermarkets, folks. These are all happening right now while we're sitting there looking at the debate, for crying out loud, uh, which is, you know, uh, the Syrian army claims the United States and Saudi Arabia allowed ISIS to flee Mosul uh, uh, to Syria. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Folks, we are on the precipice, and it is exciting for those of us who are full of Jesus and ready to go out and serve him and bring in that final harvest. And on that note, let's go ahead and bring on uh, Sister, um, uh, Sister Donna. Now, I'm looking for her number. Hold on a second. It moved. Yep, and she's at the top of the call duck right now. Praise Jesus. And let me go ahead and bring her on live. <laughs> Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Sister Donna, are you there? Is Dave with you? Uh, yeah, he's right here, if you can hear us. I'm here, Brother Johnny. Glad to be with oh, you tonight. Awesome. That's awesome. You both sound crystal clear. Praise God. Hey, listen, like as promised, as we talked earlier, I'm just going to you know, pretend like it's a church. You guys got the Holy Spirit all over you. I know you do. Um, I'm going to just go ahead and say, here, take the podium. Uh, go ahead and speak to the audience. Uh, you know, and and share with the folks. You know, uh, we had talked a little bit about the Egyptian satanic satanic masonic connection, but also feel led as the Lord leads uh, to share w- with the listeners other things uh, that He places upon your heart. Because I know you, you are a, a t- on top of, of of the darkness, the threat of the evil one, uh, and 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 what the re- what we need to be doing in preparation for the times that we have ahead of us. Praise God. So just go ahead as the Lord leads, and I'm going to fade off into the background. Yell for me if you need me, and I'll I'll reappear after I find my mic mute. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much, Brother Johnny, and I just want to thank you and all of the Tribulation Now listeners for allowing us to share tonight. We consider it a great honor and a privilege. Anytime we get to share the gospel with new friends and uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord. And as I heard Brother Johnny sharing before we came on, This is the time when the body of Christ needs to rise up and do what the body should do, cast out devils and stand against the things of evil. And like Scripture says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God will raise up a standard against it, and we are that standard. We are the body of Christ in this earth to stand against this evil and we must do it in the power and the spirit of God. There's no other way to do it. And I want to give an introduction tonight to satanic ritual abuse and to the book that we wrote, The Egyptian Masonic Satanic Connection. And my wife Donna will be joining me tonight uh, giving uh, a lot of information and her expertise. And I'm going to begin by giving a background in history and doctrine and she's going to come on and share a little bit personally about how we got involved in satanic ritual abuse, a little bit about the Blue House case that we were involved with here in Evansville, Indiana in the early 90s, and whatever else the Lord leads her to share. So I want to begin with the scripture in Romans chapter 1 and verse 30, where it gives the characteristics of a reprobate mind. And in verse 30, it says, Backbiters haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things. And one of the biggest problems we have in dealing with satanic ritual abuse is the disbelief factor that people could actually do such terrible evil things. 
and truly they are inventors of evil things. In our book, The Egyptian Masonic Satanic Connection, there are many drawings that were drawn by young children, most of them middle school age or younger, and they talk about things like rape, torture, murder, cannibalism, things that no one should be subjected to, let alone little children, and that people could do such things staggers the imagination, and it true, truly does cause us to recoil back in unbelief. But what I want to do is lay a foundation in Scripture and history to show us that this is indeed just what we should expect from the evil one. This is what he's always done. This is what he is still doing. And just as the children of God in old dealt with this, so will we by the power and the spirit of the living God. In Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5, it says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. And she is called Mystery Babylon because she came from Babylon, where the mystery religions began. And the final one world religion, which we now see taking shape worldwide, is the extenuation of the Babylonian mysteries that began with Nimrod and Semiramis. And these mystery religions incorporated the most vile of practices, including even human sacrifice. We read what, right within Scripture in Jeremiah 19 and 5. It says, They have built also the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings unto Baal, which I commanded not nor spake it, neither came it into my mind. And the connection between Satanism and Freemasonry is a very direct one. And I want to read from a book called The Builders. This book is a Masonic classic, and it details the relationship between Freemasonry and the mystery religions. And what we're going to show is that this isn't some conjecture made by a wild conspiratorial proponent but this is exactly what Freemasonry claims to be. On page 47 of this book, The Builders, it says, Masonry stands in this tradition, and if we may not say that it is historically related to the great ancient orders, it is their spiritual descendant and renders much the same ministry to our age which the mysteries rendered in the olden world. And we're going to look a little bit at what that mystery is. And Freemasonry, and as I say, this book, The Builders, it would be one of the top five Masonic books of all time. It's truly a Masonic classic. And it clearly states, as a multitude of Masonic literature does, that Freemasonry is continuing the ministry of the ancient mysteries. And on page 284 of this book, The Builders, it says, here lies the great secret of masonry, that it makes a man aware of that divinity within him, that he is indeed of God. Sin is not the problem. The problem in Freemasonry is the lack of awareness of your own divinity. And just as in the New Age and uh, all occult religions, through meditation and occult practices, the initiate is brought to the place where he realizes that he is a god. Now, in every state, the highest authority is the monitor. Every state has a Masonic monitor, and the Grand Lodge of that state is the authority for the Freemasons. Now, from the Indiana monitor, I want to read a statement on page 11 to see how blatant they are in admitting that they are doing just what the ancient mysteries used to do. On page 11 of the Indiana Monitor, it says, It is not within the scope of this short essay to develop the substantial evidence 
which supports Freemasonry's kinship with such ancient cults and societies as the ancient mysteries of Greece, the Roman colleges of artificers, or the Comocene masters, which are among the more prominent of many others. This is something that Freemasonry brags about, that they are the modern extension of the ancient mysteries. On page 12 of the Monitor for Our State here in Indiana, it says, Modern Freemasonry is, in the truest sense, a reservoir into which the cult lore and social experiences of countless eons of human experience have poured their treasures. What a statement that they are literally a reservoir or a receptacle for occult knowledge of all ages and all time. And in the symbolism of Freemasonry, which was encoded into the Blue Lodge or the first three degrees, Uh, In Freemasonry, there are three degrees in what's called the Blue Lodge, the Entered Apprentice, the Fellow Craft, and the Master Mason. And after being raised to the degree of the Master Mason, there are several options open. There's the Scottish Rite that uh, the Master Mason can enter into, or the York Rite, and there are many European Rites. Alistair Crowley was involved. Uh, he held the 97th degree of the right of Miserium Memphis. And there are many Masonic orders that the Master Mason can enter into after he has been raised to the degree of Master Mason. And this is what makes Freemasonry so nefarious, that there are so many orders and so many groups within a group that it is literally a playground for occultists. Now, prophetically, as Christians, we know and we understand that we are living in the time where we are seeing the apostate church of the book of Revelation, the one world religion, take place. In Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, the scripture says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written, in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And for many years I have taught and believed that the false prophet will be one of the popes of Rome. And in Revelation 17 and 18, the scripture tells us, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And that is city that reigned over the kings of the earth at the time that the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation, it could be none other than the city of Rome. And I was very thrilled to know, and uh, Johnny Baptist is a new friend of ours, and I'm still learning about him, and he's learning about us, but one thing I have learned is he places a very high priority upon the prophetic word and the prophetic utterance, as we do also. And my wife gave a prophecy some years ago, and I'm going to let her share the details of that. But it was along this lines. It was something that the Lord revealed to her concerning the final worship that would be instituted by the false prophet. And as she will relate to you, she was given the revelation from the Lord that this was going to be a false communion, whereas we would partake in the true taking of the communion communion in remembrance of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. This will be a Luciferian communion in which the actual elements of the wine will turn into real blood, And the bread will turn into real flesh, and it will be accompanied by other supernatural phenomenon that most people are going to be fooled into believing that these are indeed a revelation from God. Well, I want to read from a Masonic book. This is a book called Who Was Hiram Abiff by J.S.M. Ward, a 33rd degree British Freemason. This book is 
to this day sold in the McCoy Masonic Catalog. And I want to read on page 85 from this book. And what I want to do is draw a connection. Freemasonry in this book here, who is Hiram Abiff and many others, it proudly champions to continue the ministry of the mysteries. And I want to read just what took place in the mystery rites, specifically in the cult of Dionysus. And this is from page 85 of this Masonic book. It says, In these secret rites, a bull dressed up in human clothing was torn to pieces and eaten by frenzied devotees. And there is little doubt that originally it was a man, the human representative of Dionysus, who thus perished. As the dismembered carcass of the bull was eaten raw by the worshippers, there is little doubt that the sacramental feast, for such it was, was originally a cannibalistic meal. So what they're telling us is this was a communion where these, and this sounds like something out of a horror movie, where women would actually kill and tear a bull apart and eat it raw and drink its blood right in the field. And this is the way that they worship their God. And this is exactly the things that we hear children and adults all over the world tell us that goes on in satanic ritual abuse. And, well, there, there are other things I'll get into more detail late in, in a, later on. But, you know, this is graphic, and this is hard to talk about. And one of the things that the devil tries to make a lot of hay with, so to speak, is that these things are so unspeakable that it's hard for us to even think about them, let alone deal with them. But what we're dealing with now in satanic ritual abuse, this is nothing different than what was experienced in the mystery religions long ago. And in our research, we have found a distinct connection between Freemasonry and satanic ritual abuse. And this is something that has been nothing but substantiated over and over again over the past 20 years. And I want to make it clear, not all Freemasons are Satanists. Most of them would not approve of this type of behavior, thank God. But by being a part of the Masonic Lodge, they form that grassroots organization that enables this type of thing to take place in these uh, spinoff and intricate groups, and also to groups that are able to access the Blue Lodge to do what they do. Now, in the book of Ezekiel, Let's read in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. And in the third degree of Freemasonry, every Freemason plays the part of a character by the name of Hiram Abiff. And the book that I read from is called, Who is Hiram Abiff? And I'll read you the answer that he comes, conclusion he comes to in just a moment. But in Scripture, in Ezekiel, chapter 8, and verse 14, Ezekiel is given a vision of the abominations that are taking place in the temple. And one of those is stated here in verse 14. It says, Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. And in the Babylonian mysteries, Nimrod was slain because of his wickedness, and his wife, Semiramis, after his death, gave birth to a child named Tammuz. And according to their story, that Tammuz was the reincarnation of Nimrod. And at the, the spring uh, equinox and the winter solstice, they would worship their god, and they would weep as they would weep over the death, and then they would, would rejoice over the rebirth. When in uh, December, on the 25th, after the equinox, when the sun would, uh, the days would begin to get longer again, they would worship the rebirth of their god, Tammuz. So this was tied to the equinox and the solstices in the pagan worship. And I want to show once again that this is very much understood as a false communion 
by the Freemasons and by the mystery religions. And I, I want to read again from this book, Who is Hiram Abiff? And I want to give a brief summary of what took place in these rites of Tammuz. And this is why when the Lord took Ezekiel to the temple and he let him see the abominations that were going on, this is why this was such an abomination. So it's outrageous that children of God think that Freemasonry is in any way compatible with Christianity, that they can attend churches that have Masonic pastors, elders, or that in any way give the right hand of fellowship to Freemasons as children of God. But I'll just hit a few high points here from uh, who is Hiram Abiff to show what took place in these rites of Tammuz. Number one, <coughs> excuse me, at the festivals, there was promiscuous intercourse between the sexes. And uh, he goes in to quite a graphic detail of all that ensued. But they worshipped their god with the sexual act. And in Freemasonry, in the Blue Lodge, all of the symbols of the Blue Lodge represent the sexual symbols of the male and the female. As most people know, the obelisk in Washington, D.C., which is a symbol of uh, ancient Egypt and of Freemasonry, this is a phallic symbol. But in the Blue Lodge of Freemasonry, the Bible is placed over the point within the circle. And this is also explicitly explained by Albert Mackey, another one of the top Masonic authorities of all time, as representing the male and female genitalia, which is just outrageous blasphemy. Uh, going on to the rites of Tammuz, it says, in addition, every year at a date when the god Tammuz was slain, at harvest time, the women presented cakes to Astarte in the form of, and I won't even say, but you can imagine. But this is why this was such a great abomination. And there was also something tied to it. It says there was a sacramental feast which at first consisted of the body of the slain god, probably boiled in the cauldron to which our attention has been directed. And literally, little children are sacrificed, and their flesh is eaten in worship to, to Satan upon the belief that it's going to give them a longer life, that it's going to give them occult powers. And this is nothing more than a, an extension of this worship of the ancient mysteries, which is going to culminate in the beast of Revelation 13. One more here. It says, later, bread representing the flesh and wine representing the blood were certainly substituted. Probably the bread originally uh, consisted of the obscene cakes, and the wine was what was left over after a portion had been poured out as a libration to a start date. So this is what we're looking at. We're looking at a apostate communion where there is the sacrifice of animals and often human beings. This is the worship that is going to be finally culminated in the book of Revelation, when people are going to be forced to partake in this worship and this false communion. And I believe, as others do, that it's quite possible that this is going to result in a genetic transformation where a person will literally go transhuman or beyond the veil of humanity, which is why, as Scripture says, that those that worship the beast and take the mark, that they will at that point have sealed their eternal fate. In Revelation 13, beginning in verse 16, you know the scripture, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. 
Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. And for many years, Freemasonry has bragged that they will fill the bill of the universal religion. And the blue blood of the occult world has come down through theosophy. It began with Madame Blavatsky, and Madame Blavatsky passed the baton to Annie Besant and 33rd Degree Freemason C.W. Leadbeater. And from Mrs. Besant, it was passed to a lady by the name of Alice Bailey. And while Alice Bailey was the queen of the occult world, so to speak, her husband, Foster Bailey, who was a prominent, prominent Freemason, he was writing books on Freemasonry and speaking in Masonic lodges all over the world. And in a book that is still to this day sold in the McCoy catalog called The Spirit of Masonry, Foster Bailey spoke to the issue of Freemasonry being a worldwide religion. And many of my friends will believe in a Jesuit Catholic conspiracy. In other words, they believe that the Jesuits control everything. And the Jesuits are certainly a part of it. Don't misunderstand me. And I also have friends who believe in a Jewish conspiracy, that the Jews control everything. And the Jews certainly are playing a part. Certainly the Rothschilds and many Jewish people are also a part of this. Make no mistake about that. But there are many groups involved. And what we need to understand and what I try to share with people is that Freemasonry is the coordinating factor of all of these groups. And within Freemasonry, there is a super right called Palladium Freemasonry, which was started by Albert Pike and Giuseppe Mazzini. And when we begin to understand that, we begin to see the guiding hand that Freemasonry plays, not only in coordinating international events, but also in coordinating things like satanic ritual abuse on a, on a local level. And this is something that we'll speak to more at a proper time. But this is what Foster Bailey said about Freemasonry. On page 109 of this book, he said, A revitalized Masonry made up of Masons true to their obligation and realizing the mystic tie that binds them all together in one true brotherhood would also provide a platform so universal that it would meet the need of thinkers of all kinds and of every school of thought. It would thus not only meet a religious need but pro by providing a universal religion, but would also satisfy the mental need felt by all broad-minded thinkers at one time. And if you ask the question, what do all of the world political leaders and all of the world's religious leaders have in common? They all meet around the common altar of Freemasonry, which says that there are many ways to God, and this is the dividing line. Our Lord Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And Freemasonry claims that all roads lead to God, thus providing the groundwork for a universal religion where people of all religions and political persuasions can come together to foster this ultimate goal of a one-world religion and a, and a new world order. One more statement from Mr. Bailey. On page 125, he said, Study of spiritual realities found in masonry reveals that we have perpetuated and increasingly activated the essential principles of the ancient mystery schools which have re existed from the very earliest times. And you cannot read a Masonic book of any note that does not state that Freemasonry is continuing the ancient mysteries. Well, I just believe what they say. And when you read the, the study, the ancient mysteries, it involved torture, it involved 
human sacrifice, animal sacrifice, all of the things that we hear victims of satanic ritual abuse tell us that is going on there. So just by virtue of that fact, of knowing no more than what we've shared so far, we should expect at least the possibility that within Freemasonry and the groups that work in and out of Freemasonry, that we should at least be suspicious that such things might take place. Now, I'm going to have my wife Donna come on now, and she is going to share a little bit of how we got involved in this and uh, whatever else the Lord lays upon her heart. Donna? Yes. Um, I'm presuming everybody can hear me okay. I um, am happy to share this. I've shared it many times, and especially over the last few months. But when um, David and I met, uh, it was in a little small town up the highway here from where we live now. And we um, felt some unrest that we, after we got married, we thought, well, are we doing everything we need to do well one day David was uh, teaching Sunday school class and the Lord spoke to him and said I want you to move and so he came home and we prayed got down on our knees and we knew logically that the Lord would want us to move to a bigger city so we'd have more ministry uh, abilities uh, you know contacts and also uh, for our jobs because we were working in the secular world and we needed those contacts. So we got we knew that the two biggest towns uh, um to move to that we knew of would be Evansville or Indianapolis. Uh Evansville is the state capital and uh I mean excuse me, Indianapolis is the state capital and Evansville is the third largest city in Indiana. Well when we got up off our knees we both knew that it was Evansville. I only had one business contact here, and we didn't know anybody. So two weeks later, David took a leave from his uh, job in a factory, and um, we came to Evansville and applied for jobs. David got the first job he applied for, and I had gotten a job over the phone because I was a hairstylist by uh, profession. And we just knew God wanted us down here in Evansville. So we went to... um, a little church, the same denomination we were out of, and they rejected me because I wore slacks. Um, And I was just a baby Christian. I hadn't been saved but six months, and I'd never had that problem of being treated that bad uh, by people that were supposed to be Christians. So we went to another church, and that didn't work out. So then we ended up at an assembly of God where we met the youth pastor, Rick Doniger. And... Rick began to share with us how these people were coming to him, some adult survivors and now some parents of these little children were coming to him and saying that the children alleged they were taken out of school by either school teachers or a principal and taken to a blue house here in town and were satanically, ritually abused. And, you know, Rick... um, didn't know that much at the time about Freemasonry, and neither did we, because we had just come down here and started a home ministry, and the only part that I knew was my own um, experience of being abused, which I'll go into in a little bit. But at the time, we didn't really know about the Masonic involvement, and so we started researching the Masons, and this is all a snowball effect, I guess you'd say, we were uh, we had a little program on Christian radio, and we were interviewing authors, and our friend Tom McKinney uh, came up for a, a program, and he wrote a book called The Deadly Deception, him and Jim Shaw, and they revealed some of the things that went on in Freemasonry, and we're just going, wow, we didn't know that. And then as we got more and more involved with ministering to these children, we found out that they alleged that the teacher that took them, we found out he was a Mason, and the principal was a Shriner. And um, during the time that the children had claimed to be abused, we see uh, David um, 
did you say he went through his 33rd degree then, or the Shriner? I'm trying to remember what you said. Yeah, during the end. Um, during the investigation. Yeah, during the during the time. Yeah, during the time we were doing the investigation, he received his 33rd degree in the in the Masonic Lodge. So we just we thought, okay, what are the good old boys doing involved with these children? So, you know, we never want to ever falsely accuse anyone. We are uh, avid researchers and writers, and so we began to document these things, and we began to research Freemasonry and the history of Freemasonry, and we found out why that the good old boys were involved. And as David said, not all Masons are Satanists, but because of the secrecy involved in the Lodge, uh, anybody can come in and recruit um, and nothing will ever be said about it because these men swear blood oaths to have their heart torn out of their chest or throat cut. Um, there's so many oaths. Within the first three degrees, I believe they say about 40 oaths, and they're sworn to secrecy. They can't even tell their wife what goes on. In fact, they're made to take off their wedding rings because they have to be divested of all metals, and that's also connected to witchcraft rituals. Um there are just so many things. Freemasonry is the. I really can't say that it. I really can't describe it. After all these years that we have researched it, I can't think of anything too much more evil than how Freemasonry deceives people. It deceives the church because most of the time there's many Masons within churches and people don't do anything about it because they are really truly ignorant in the true sense of the word. It's, nothing is preached from the pulpits to expose them and say what they're really involved in. And just by way of beginning this explanation about uh, abuse, and Ed, I totally agree with David what he said about, you know, the enemy wants to keep it so bad that nobody will believe it really exists. But um, when people, they call us, they say, well, I've been in SRA. Well, we have ways that we discover what they've been involved in. But okay, I want to have a quote here from our book. We have a book we've written called From Victims to Victors Through the Cross of Jesus Christ. We offer this book and our Egyptian Masonic Satanic Connection book through our ministry. And you can find our ministry website at www. F-O-J-C-Radio.com. It's like followers of Jesus Christ. So we just put the initials, add radio, and dot com. And on that site, you'll see our book page where all the books are listed. But in our book, on page 80, um, there, we have a quote from uh, Karen Stardancer, a newsletter that she had out. And I just think it's better for me to read it to explain. Okay, quote, Occasionally, I am asked the difference between ritual abuse and satanic ritual abuse. The short answer is little, if any. I define ritual abuse separately from satanic ritual abuse, solely for the purpose of clarity. When there, <clears throat> when there is not an obvious reference for and the worship of the entity, Satan, or a specific demonic, the end result as a participant is either essentially the same for the perpetrator and victim. When the perpetrators do not realize or acknowledge the demonic satanic entities that feed off their behavior, I refer to it as ritual abuse. When perpetrators clearly recognize their actions are for the purpose of obtaining power from specific demonic satan entities, I refer to that as satanic ritual abuse. It is purely a matter of semantics. However, in my opinion, they are interchangeable terms. When writing and speaking, I will often use the generic term ritual abuse to refer to any and all forms of ritual behavior that create trauma. Regardless of its purpose or reason, I try to refrain from using the term satanic ritual abuse because I've found that many will discount the seriousness of their occultic abuse because, well, there weren't actually worshiping satan they were just involved in some weird stuff why does it seem important to separate 
one form of evil from another for some survivors. If it isn't honoring the Lord, if it isn't building up character, image, and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, what difference does it make if it's RA or SRA? Your life has been extremely messed up either way. The devastation and healing journey is pretty much the same regardless. So, basically, ritual abuse is repeated abuse. Satanic ritual abuse is usually done during a ritual that involves it's dedicated to spirits, demons, or a god other than the god of the Bible. So we we distinguish it in that way. Now, when we deal with Freemasonry, a lot of people, they just can't believe that Freemasons would be involved in such a thing. Well, I have um, a few other quotes from our other book, our Egyptian Masonic Satanic Connection. I know that's a really long name and a mouthful, but we couldn't figure out what else to call it to cover all the areas that we were covering because we compared the Egyptian mystery religions, the Masonic rituals and Satanic rituals, and compared all like their symbols and the things they did. And we also were ministering to the children at the time, and we have 37 pictures in here of rituals that have gone They've gone all over the world because people wanted to know. They wanted to compare. Survivors wanted substantiation to compare if what they remembered was what other survivors were remembering. Um, We have a few quotes here. I'm just going to go through a few here. My name is Neil, and I experienced at least 18 years of satanic ritual abuse by several groups of Masons. The Masons all over the country are an organization, a secret order, and part of what they do is ritually abuse children, adults, and animals. The people in my family are to blame, as well as the Masons and our society, for allowing it to happen. The Masons are an organized part of society, including politicians, judges, lawyers, policemen, rabbi. Fifty percent of the actual abuse took place on Masonic properties. So that was Neil's testimony. Now, a practicing psychotherapist told us, I am a psychotherapist in private practice and treat mainly survivors of satanic cult abuse. About half the clients I treat report that their fathers were Masons. About half the others report that a very close friend of the family was a Mason. They recall going to parties and gatherings at the homes of Masons. And... There's more. There's from a, um, she says, I'm a Christian lay counselor. I'm a Christian lay counselor who works with women who have been sexually and ritually abused. I and other counselors I know have had clients report childhood sexual and ritual abuse occurring during Masonic rituals. I have begun seeking information from other counselors as well as those who are exposing the Masons for written material that would confirm that this type of abuse is real. Well, my response is, yes, it's very real. After the thousands of survivors we have talked to for years, yes, they were abused by Masons. They can, some have a very firm testimony that could be documented. Others are are having memories where they remember things. Um, one of the things we ask when we're ministering to people, we ask them, do you have any relatives that are Masons? We can't ask leading questions. Um, And so it's not out of ordinary that you could ask someone about their relatives. So we ask gently and several times, and I would say a good 85%, Somebody always has relatives that are Masons, but then you can find out if they were abused by Masons. And we we just praise God for all the ways that he's opened the doors for us to try to minister to people. We've always wanted to educate people in what we have found out, especially the church, because we feel that they are so lacking in education in these areas. We have many survivors that come to us to ask for help because they've went to their own pastors or churches and they have no idea how to begin to deal with this issue. And that's one of the reasons why we wrote our book, 
from victims to victors through the cross of Christ because we wanted to have a, a guidebook. We we don't claim to have all the answers, but we do know that God is faithful and he can heal. And we have some basic things that we deal with. We, we deal with soul ties, uh, uh, rash vows, uh, iniquities, uh, implants. It's, it's like a, it's a book that will help you to clean the garbage out of your life. And so we do offer that in our, our ministry to help us heal. Now, I just want to touch on this a little bit. I was recently, <laughs> I did a, a, a video about Halloween, and I had one person post um, a comment that was very upsetting to me, and and he was very um, disrespectful. And um, I really was upset thinking that somebody would actually attack me like that. But then on the other hand, um, there's a scripture in Matthew that the Lord gave me that I am to be happy when I'm persecuted and when men revile me in such a way. Because in that video, I had mentioned my distaste for the Halloween holiday because of what had been done to me. Because I am a survivor of abuse. I'm a survivor of incest, molestation on both sides of my family, rape. And then later in my life, I was um, not saved in a in a searching situation in my life, just searching for love in all the wrong places, as the old song says. And I got involved with a witch and two Satanists. I had no idea what they were because I had never been taught in my little Baptist church that there was such a thing as groups of people that would worship the devil or Satan or other entities. I had never been taught that. I was really naive. And so when I got into this they were just people that i had met in the taverns i didn't i just didn't know what they were and then um one guy when he did a ritual i actually um thank god it was never completed but the point that i want to make is it was tied to alistair crowley type rituals and we have that because we can read his materials and we can find out. So praise God, it was never completed. The memories I have from the other was also kind of a Crowley-like magical um, ritual. Some of these things I didn't remember till later. And I want to say right now, you do not have to remember everything in order to get well. God will help you to get well. He will help you to remember things that you need to remember. But there is hope and there is healing through the Lord. And I got into it by accident. Thank God I got out of it very quickly. But I experienced just enough to know the reality of it. When we started working with these children, the Lord used my compassion. And I believe in Romans 8 and 28 where the Bible says, all things work together for good for them that are called by God and and love God, and they're called for a purpose. And I'm misquoting that from the King James, but I'm paraphrasing. I think God will take some of the bad things that's happened in your life and will use them for good. Nowadays, our society is so bombarded with nakedness. And I, the nakedness scripture, I looked it up one time, there's a lot in the Bible about nakedness. In Leviticus, it's got long list, and I, I'm not going to read all of them, but in Leviticus chapter 18, 5 through 30, after scripture, after scripture, after scripture, it's nakedness, nakedness with this, in this situation, nakedness in another situation. And these people were stoned. They were put to death. They were rejected. They were sent out of the country they and nowadays we see so much we just accept it but you see there are scriptures that says you thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife um like i said different situations 
all through Leviticus um, chapter 18, verses 5 through 30. And then on in Leviticus 20, verse uh, 7 through 27, it, it also says things like, in verse 13, If a man also lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be surely put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And on down, If a man lie with the beast, he shall surely be put to death. And ye shall slay the beast. And if a woman approach unto any beast, and lie down thereunto, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And then it goes on and on. Now, we're not condoning you go out and kill these people if you know they've done this. But it also talks about what should be done to witches, and it says to kill them too. We're not condoning that here. But this is what God said to do in the Old Testament. But what I'm saying is we are so desensitized through what we see on TV everywhere. And lately, there's been a lot of Hollywood um, commercials and things like when they have the Olympics and they have their entry uh, ceremonies and things. You are seeing more and more of this man plus animal type thing. And it's it's revolting. But in the elements that we can deal with that we know that people suffer from satanic ritual abuse, there's no two cults who hold identical ceremonies. Um, Many are reported that they have people in 30s and 40s and wear black robes and others. I mean, we have had people tell us that they were abused in churches, in church buildings, regular churches, not satanic churches, regular churches. And I just, I don't talk about this a lot, but I have memories of being abused by Masons in that Baptist church where I attended as a child. Now, can I prove that? No, not at this point, just my testimony. But when I had the memory, I knew which one was a deacon of the church. Later, when I read his obituary, yes, he was a mason. So, you know, when children are abused in this way, they are they get threats and intimidations. And one thing you'll notice in the pictures in this book of a the uh, rituals the children drew. You'll see in the corner there's a little black square that represents a camera. Almost everyone that draws those pictures shows that little black square because they're intimidated by this camera. Even if the camera is not really on, they're intimidated. If if they tell, the, uh, the perpetrators will say, if you tell, we're going to show people what you did. They're forced to do ritual killings. They're stripped. They're put in cages. Um, They're raped. I mean, there's other objects that's put inside of them. Usually there's drugs involved. They're usually um, mutilation animals. And most of them talk about being terrorized by putting and being put in a coffin. And then snakes or spiders or some other kind of rodents are put. And they're even lowered into a hole. Some of them are even covered up with dirt and then they're dug back up again. And then we hear we have heard other testimonies of women that claim they were breeders, that they were forced to be pregnant and their babies were cut out of them and then sacrificed for that purpose. They were bred particularly for that purpose. Others talk about marriage ceremonies, that they're married to Satan, uh, married to Satan. Many of them say that, and this is one of the reasons why they don't tell, a lot of times they're told that a bomb has been put inside of them. And therefore, if they would tell, that bomb would explode. And many of them have a suicide personality programmed into them so that when they start to tell, they will automatically want to commit suicide. How bad is this? Way back, um, I think in a 2007 article, it says that there is over 800,000 children missing. And this article says it's true that 797,000 
500 people under 18 were reported missing in a one-year period, according to a 2002 study. But of those cases, 203,900 were family abductions and 58,200 were non-family. And so this shows you that usually they would be abducted by someone in their family. But it's true. They're missing. Another article says that... um, and that adds up to about 2,000 children a day. And then we hear all these amber alerts. And next time that you see one of them, don't grumble about it when it interrupts your program on your TV or it comes on your phone. Be thankful that they have amber alerts now. And right here in Duro, Indiana, between Indianapolis, Indiana, and Um, Evansville, Indiana, it's called the Valley. It's the largest concentration of 33rd degree Masons in the world. So no wonder that there was so much going on down here. And that's why we know God called us down here to do this fight. I have more information about specifically about Indiana. There's some here that says a child's body was found in a search for missing toddler. It was found here in Indiana. Then there was another. There was a lawsuit filed against the Evansville Catholic um, discotheque. It's a lawsuit filed against it. That was in July 26, 2010. That was the. I found this on the internet. I never saw it in the newspaper here. Then there's articles in our paper. I actually was just happened to get a paper one day when there's like two different articles in here about an elite school that settles its abuse claims. Then there's another one, Florida launches new probe into troubled school. It's And it's all over the Internet. Abuse happens every day. And children suffer for the rest of their lives with memories. And when they go to churches to get help, a lot of churches will say, you just need to forget about it. Well, Survivors can't really forget about it. Yes, God can dull the memory. Yes, he can help us overcome it. He offers healing and cleansing through all of these things. And I'm so thankful to God that he does use our ministry to help expose this. I minister to a lot of people that have um, MPD, multiple personality disorder, Um, there is healing for that. I've seen survivors be set free and put back together again, and I'm thankful for that. And on the other issue that David had mentioned, God uses me sometimes in a lot of different ways, but the night I came home from a Christian concert, the Lord spoke to me and showed me in Scripture that there was going to be a false communion. It was June 2001. And I thought, well, what does that mean? And why are you telling me? I guess I just happened to be listening at the right time to the Lord. And he knew that I would tell people about this. But he showed me in Scripture, and I kept saying, Lord, show me that I'm wrong. Well, everywhere he sent me, it confirmed. And since that time, we've done several different radio programs and we did finally we wrote another book we called it the luciferian transmutation where we explain about the connection with the catholic faith because in order to understand transmutation you really need to understand transubstantiation because as david said he believes that the false prophet will be a pope it could be the one we have now he's a prime candidate since he's a jesuit but Um, there's other things that we know about him, too, that we have learned through our research. But, yes, we are coming into this time where the world is going to have a new new world order, but it'll also have a one world religion. And we think that religion will be headed up by a, a false prophet, a pope, that will be offering this false communion. And 
all I can say is that we have researched this. And when the Lord told me that, I just, I was in shock that the Lord would tell me something like that so important. But through the years, as David shared, we have substantiated it, its connection with the Masonic aspect, how they believed in the Holy Grail, how they believed in transmutation. And this information is also in the book we call the Luciferian Transmutation. So basically what we've tried to do is educate people, and we're still doing that, and we continue to do that on a daily basis. And we get calls every day, and I think now it's even increased. Of course, this is the time of the year for the increase as well. But we get, there's never two weeks go by, but what we don't have contact with another survivor of some kind of abuse. And this Masonic connection, yes, it's very real. They interviewed children. We're in the process. There's going to be a documentary by Now You See TV about the Blue House case again. We call it the Blue House case because that's the house the kids were taken to is the Blue House. The Blue House is no longer here. It's been bulldozed down. I don't think that the abuse has really stopped. We did what we could. At the time, the prosecutor, Stan Levko, decided not to prosecute. He even bragged about it, how he was that was the greatest height of his career, was not prosecuting that case. Now we have a new prosecutor, and hopefully he will prosecute cases when these kind come to him. So that's just about all I have to say about it. And, David, you go ahead and finish up with what you want to do. All right. Thank you, dear. And in the time remaining, I'm going to try to connect some dots for the listeners here on Tribulation Now Radio to give you a more detailed understanding of why there's a connection between Freemasonry and satanic ritual abuse. We were the first ministry to draw the connection between Freemasonry and satanic ritual abuse. We did this in the early 90s at an apologetic presentation in St. Louis, and since that time, the Lord has revealed to many, many others worldwide that this is something that is indeed real. And I want to share some points from Chapter 9 in our book, The Egyptian Masonic Satanic Connection, where I give nine connections between Freemasonry and Satanic Ritual Abuse. Now, the first is overlapping membership. We see people that are Freemasons that are also leaders in these occult groups. And Anton LaVey made a statement that we would also often use in seminars that every serious occult order can be traced right back to the Masonic Lodge, and this is absolutely correct. But here's a few of the names. Aleister Crowley, who was a Satanist and a member of the Ordo Templar Orientis, Ordo Templar Orientis. Gerald Gardner, who was the founder of Gardenian Witchcraft. Alex Sanders, who was the founder of Alexandrian Witchcraft. Wynne Westcott, and S.L. McGregor Mathers, who were two of the founders of the Golden Dawn. They were also Freemasons. Eliphas Levi, who drew the picture of the Baphomet, he was a Freemason. The founders of the OTO were Freemasons. Uh, Gerald, uh, Theodore Roos and Carl Kellner. I could go on and on and on and on with not just, and these are the leaders, but also the membership. Originally, the Golden Dawn was exclusively Masonic, and it met originally in a Masonic Lodge Hall in England. So this is a serious reason to consider the connection between Freemasonry and Satanic Ritual Abuse is the overlapping membership. Point number two is the overlapping theology. I've already read several graphic statements from Masonic books, and I'll read 
one from a man that was called Freemasonry's greatest philosopher. And this man is called Manly P. Hall. And these are not just little obscure people that I'm sharing their thoughts, but these are the Masonic authorities. These are the men that Freemasonry lifts up. He was eulogized in his obituary in the Scottish Rite Journal as Freemasonry's greatest philosopher. And just recently, there's been a book written about Manly P. Hall that uh, the author, and it was very much a book that was trying to put him in a good light. But on Coast to Coast AM, they interviewed the man that wrote the book, and it told about the bizarre way in which he died. And at the time of his death, uh, he was living together with his male friend, and he was becoming sick. And to try to prevent his death, he was doing occult rituals. And this involved pouring his own urine upon an anthill and getting the ants to somehow take his disease away. It was absolutely bizarre. But when they found Mr. Hall, when his male friend called for the uh, ambulance to come take his body away, when they came in, literally they reported that his eyes and mouth and nose, that he was just covered with ants in some kind of a bizarre, it would sound like something you would see in the most extreme horror films. He died very, very badly. But on page 48 of his book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry, this is what Mr. Hall said. When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft, the seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy. An absolutely outrageous statement that Freemasons must learn to harness the energy of Lucifer if they're going to move onward and upward in their craft. And this is the type of occultism and universalism that would lead us to suspect that Freemasonry is a playground for all things evil and bizarre. On page 65 of Mr. Hall's book, he says this, The true Mason is not creed-bound. He realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that as a Mason, his religion must be universal. Christ, Buddha, or Mohammed, the name means little, for he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. He worships at every shrine, bows before every altar, whether in temple, mosque, or cathedral, realizing with his truer understanding the oneness of all spiritual truth. And as children of God, we know that this flies in the face of true divine revelation, which our word tells us, neither there is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name given, it, given under heaven among men, whereby we must be saved. Only through Jesus will we find salvation. The third point is Masonic secrecy. And Donna alluded to this a little bit earlier. And in the Word of God, the Scripture tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. But in Freemasonry, Masonic secrecy lays the foundation for these type of things to go on. Every time a Freemason goes into the lodge hall, they meet with a group of men that have sworn a horrible death oath never to reveal what goes on inside those halls. And this is indeed the dream of the carnal man, that they can go into a place where they can do anything they want and get away with it, and no one will ever tell. But they cannot get away from the all-knowing, omniscient God of the Holy Bible. 
But this is the oath. There's many, many oaths. There's so many oaths that uh, we couldn't go through all the Masonic oaths and Freemasonry in an entire program. But this is the very first oath that a Mason takes. It's in the inner apprentice, the very first degree of the Blue Lodge. But this is the oath from the uh, first degree of the Blue Lodge. All this I most solemnly sincerely promise and swear with a firm and steadfast resolution to perform the same without any mental reservation or secret evasion of mind whatever, binding myself under no less penalty than that of having my throat cut across, my tongue torn out by its roots, and my body buried in the rough sands of the sea at low water mark where the tide ebbs and flows twice in 24 hours should I ever knowingly violate this, my inner apprentice obligation. And what has been discovered, and I have personally had this shown to me by law enforcement uh, officials here in Indiana, by John Waterman, who was the sheriff of our home county in Sullivan County. He was sheriff at the time. He went on to be a Indiana congressman. But John took Rick and I up there and spent an entire day taking us to ritual sites, and he actually showed us photographs where murders had been committed explicitly the way that the penalties are to be carried out in Masonic rituals. This is also holds true in the Jack the Ripper murders in England. These were Masonic executions that were ritualistic murders performed according to the penalties of Freemasonry. And this is something that is often not revealed in uh, murder and crime cases. But the the connection between Freemasonry and hardcore occult crime and murder is is just phenomenal. But point number four is the coordination theory. If the 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 things that we were told by the children here in Evansville is that they were being taken out of their school and taken to a blue house where unspeakable things were done to them, that they were being drugged, that school teachers were a part of it. And if these children were telling us a true story, there had to be some kind of a coordinating factor between the police, the education uh, institutions, and, uh, and other areas there had to be a guiding hand coordinating on all of these things. And the the institution that would fit the bill like no other would be Freemasonry. Because as we found out, not only were the people the children were accusing of these things Freemasons, but also the police officers investigating them were also Freemasons. And this is when we began to get a clue that there was an unseen hand guiding this diabolical enterprise. Thus, we begin to seriously research and come up with more and more connections in the Egyptian Masonic Satanic connection. Now, point number five are the recruitment possibilities. And Aleister Crowley, who we've referred to, Previously, in this evening's conversation, he is known as the father of modern Satanism. And Mr. Crowley was not only a third-degree Master Mason and a 33rd-degree Scottish Rite Freemason, but he was also held the 97th degree in the European Rite of Miserium Memphis. Mr. Crowley made the statement that if he would put all of his Masonic medals on at one time, that this would be enough to cause an elephant to stumble. And in his own autobiography, Mr. Crowley tells how that he was recruited out of Freemasonry into the Ordo Templar Orientis. I'll read you his own words. Although I was admitted to the 33rd degree, 
the 33rd and last degree of Freemasonry so long ago as 1900, it was not until the summer of 1912 that my suspicion was confirmed. I speak of my belief that behind the frivolities and convivialities of our greatest institution lay in truth a secret, ineffable, and miraculous potent to control the forces of nature, and not only to make men brethren, but make them divine. But at the time I speak of a man, but the, at the time I speak of, a man came to me, a man of those mysterious masters of esoteric Freemasonry, who are alike its eyes and its brains, and who exist in its midst, unknown often even to its acknowledged chiefs. This man Theodore Roos, Frater Merlin, from whom Crowley took over the headship of the OTO, had been watching my occult career for some years and deemed me now worthy per, to partake in the greater mysteries. And just like Aleister Crowley was recruited from Freemasonry to the Ordo Templar Orientis, Witches and Satanists can go all over the world. They can go into lodge halls. They can invite people to join whatever little thing they got going. And if the person doesn't like it, they have already sworn a death oath when they came in the door not to tell anything about it. This is the ideal recruitment ground for Satanists, Freemasons, and witches, or whatever stripe of evil someone is trying to put together and coordinate. Point number six is the cover-up theory. And I want to read from the Duncan's Ritual of Freemasonry, and this just lets you know how serious Freemasons are about covering up one another's crimes. This is what it says from the Royal Arch Degree. It says, this is the oath, I furthermore promise and swear that I will assist the companion Royal Archmason when I see him engaged in any difficulty and will espouse his cause so far as to extricate him from the same, whether he be right or wrong. Doesn't matter if the Mason's wrong or is guilty, that fellow Royal Arch Freemason is obligated by a death oath to get him off the hook. It continues, I furthermore promise and swear that I will keep all the secrets of a companion royal archmason when communicated to me as such, or I knowing them to be such, without exceptions, it says. So this is certainly a blanket ticket for the propagation of all kinds of evil. you have something you want to add, Donna? Well, I just want to say that everything God does... The enemy wants to try to do better <laughs> and pervert it. In Leviticus it says the life is in the blood, and we see so much blood in these rituals, blood, blood, blood. You know, the enemy wants to take blood and pervert it. That is exactly what the false communion is going to be about, taking the precious blood of Jesus Christ and perverting it into a ritual that will be offered for probably a one-time uh, immortality. The, this is what the Lord has shown us. And it could be even tainted with Nephilim blood. It could be contained. It could have a DNA change. But what we want to warn people is be careful. Know who's giving you that communion. Know, really, know who the body of Christ is. And with all this dark and gloom that we've said tonight, God is faithful. He can heal. He can deliver. He can set you free. It is a process, usually. But God can do it in an instant, but he will be with you. So if anyone's listening that's been involved in Freemasonry, you can come out of it. We know how to help you do that. Yes, you can come out of it. If you're a survivor of abuse, yes, we can help you. We can help you be cleansed of it. Yes, we have people that pray that will be praying for you. So please contact our ministry. And thank you, Johnny, for having us on here so much. Our contact information is readily available on our website, www.fojcradio.com. 
Yeah, praise God. That's awesome. Uh, uh, what a, what an in depth. Uh, uh, revealing of uh, how how sick and twisted and pervasive this problem is. Uh, amen. And um, would you um, also uh, close the show tonight with a prayer for us? And I certainly will. And I just want to thank you again, Johnny, and I want to thank all of the Tribulation Now listeners. And like to say, what we bring tonight is not a message of doom, but it's a message of victory and a message of challenge to the body of Christ to be what we need to be, to cast out devils and to be that standard. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you tonight for this chance to share your word in the power of your mighty spirit. Lord, we just pray right now that anyone that's victimized by this evil, that you just speak hope to their heart right now and let them know that there is victory and deliverance in the Lord Jesus Christ. We also pray the convicting power of the Holy Spirit upon anyone that is involved in Freemasonry, that they know also that the Lord can forgive and cleanse and bring them from this evil. Lord Jesus, we just pray a blessing upon this broadcast, that it will just speak to the hearts of those that need to be delivered and set free, and we give you the praise for everything good that happens. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, what a powerful message. Um, again, FOJCRadio.com. Uh, if you want to look into it more or you need some help with uh, things or need to help somebody who you know has been troubled by such things in their past. So anyway, praise Jesus for your work. God bless you all. We'll see you this Friday at the Friday Night Prayer Vigil, Saturday night for the Peterson Chronicles, and then this Sunday we have Dr. Bill G- Deagle joining us as well to really uh, uh, reveal some pretty dark stuff that's out there, folks, so we know what we're fighting against. All right, God bless you all. See you then. Thank you so much for joining us.